Oh, hey, everybody. Good morning. I hope you have a nice cup of coffee. And if it's your thing, coffee is your thing. I hope it's a Black Rifle coffee. Do you live in an area where there is a Black Rifle coffee? Because I'm looking at their website right now, and they have a new order ahead option. Now, I hate to say that the Kalispell store is probably never going to have an order ahead option via the Black Rifle coffee app itself, but we're going to figure it out locally. But I digress. If you live somewhere where there is a Black Rifle coffee, you should definitely explore this. It's going to save you time because you can just order and go. If you don't have that, I mean, obviously, you need to be going to the website, blackriflecoffee.com, and ordering whatever roast of coffee you may like. They have a little slider at the bottom that goes all the way from light to extra dark. Myself, personally, I'm kind of like a medium roast. And then, of course, how are you going to make it? I actually just ordered one of their new fellow pour overs. It's not like a full Chemex. Um, and I got the bigger one. I think it's a 20 ounce. And I got it because I want to be able to do it on the road. I want to be able to boil up some water, grind up some beans and do a nice pour over. It is my perfect, no, I shouldn't say perfect. It is my favorite way to enjoy Black Rifle Coffee. So there's nothing but options. BlackRifleCoffee.com. Get your coffee fix. Get your friends their coffee fix. Get them pointed in the right direction because nobody wants to see people drinking coffee. That sucks. Now, my guest today, Wiley McGraw, the best way to describe him, or probably the easiest way for me to describe him, is that he is a performance coach. Um, and I don't think he would necessarily use those terms, but I think I'm close enough. He works with a very small number of people, uh, only a few per year, and he gets into that during the episode, but it's completely about dialing in their life and improving their performance at whatever it is that they do. Now, before that, he was a baseball athlete growing up. You know, why not become a competitive bull rider? You know, join the Army at some point in time in that as well. So a fascinating background, and I love what he is doing with that experience and how he is helping people optimize their performance. So how about we just get into the episode? Number 272 with Wiley McGraw. Enjoy. Okay, I got the red smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, wait a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. Where do you call home? Sedona. Arizona, huh? So let me see here. That is, let me see if my geography serves me well. That's north of Prescott, right? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Northeast. Northern Lee. Northern Lee. Right. Yeah. About and then you start hour, getting no. into the redwoods there, right? You do. The okay. Into Flagstaff. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It's pretty good. How I long love... have you lived there? Three years. What brought you there? We got the hell out of California. The pandemic. Why would you do something uh, like that? I don't know. It's... <laughs> the politics of California are awesome. And I've been told it's super reasonable for the price of housing. <laughs> I love I love this I love the sarcasm I like to read it it's fun to have a, a, a banter with it but no it's um I was born and raised in yeah California. I know you were yeah, sort and so was I Orange County originally okay yeah from Anaheim um but then I met my wife and uh, we moved to San Diego we saw a little place in like the UTC La Jolla area near that big fantastic area yeah Mormon Temple that you see off the five freeway so yep. we kept that but we've been coming to Sedona for like ten years visiting vacation just get away from san diego for like two months out of the year yeah and i it might she was like i gotta live here i gotta get out of this i gotta get out of california it's too much there's too much craziness going on out here the, the vibe's too different it's just not for us anymore so when we left our last trip right before the pandemic started um our agent called said hey we got some homes so we just took another trip back out there for a week we looked some houses and bought what was the tipping point for you guys from california so i was already up here right pre-pandemic i didn't get to really experience what I have heard other people talk about in California, but it seems like it's the combination of, yeah, did that thing drip on you? You know who did that? That was Michael. He didn't put the lid on properly. Mm. Well, I'll remember that. We'll, yeah. we'll see. Or somebody that works at the coffee shop. <laughs> hey, it happens. So I missed, but anyway. yeah, you know, I only heard, uh, well, I guess it would be fourth or fifth hand about things that were happening in California. I, you know, we made the decision to move up here in 20, God, 17 now. Mm. Crossed the border July 1st of 2017, but obviously made the decision to move before that. It was a combination of things, but a lot of it was the denseness of the just – I could – if I wanted to, I never did this, but I know that if while in my shower in the bathroom, could open a window and touch the stucco of the house next to us. And it was a fantastic house. Don't get me wrong. We 
we moved back to California from Virginia when the market was correcting. I mean, we mm. were able to, I've only had one experience with a short sale and it was on the buyer side and it was fantastic. I had heard nightmare stories. It worked out great for us. That's good. And we got into a house that honestly added <clears throat> as an E6 that became an O1 in the military. Right. <laughs> I shouldn't have been able to afford, but the people who bought it before me yeah. also shouldn't have been able to afford it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hence the short sale. Yeah. So it was yeah. kind of cascading. Mm. The denseness of the population was a tough one for me. I kind of avoided all of the political stuff because I would just leave my house and go to work and come back. Right. But the price, uh, the schools, I wasn't necessarily incredibly fired up with. And we the weather is great, but we moved up here after spending a good amount of time on vacations. And mm. our kids were more active. Mm -hmm. It it felt <clears throat> different. You'd wake up. That's it, yeah. The, that's I, the key. So quiet that your ears would ring. That's and I right. I don't know if that makes sense to people. It does. But, yeah. yeah. Well, that makes sense, Andy. It's um, the vibration of of that more dense population. You feel it, and then when you leave and you get into a place like Montana, yeah, um, Arizona mountains, anywhere that is quieter, you feel the difference, and it's almost eerie sometimes because you're calibrating to that shift. Yeah. And I, we were. I remember we would drive back because we would drive from San Diego to Sedona every year. And it's only a seven hour drive, easy. Get up at four in the morning and we're on the road by four forty five and we're we're in town before noon. Um, but we would come back from our trips and I can see my wife, you know, tearing up and she could feel just the heaviness of coming back. The tension. That. Yeah. As you get She's closer. like, I can't do this anymore, sweetie. And I said, I get it hundred percent. And if things fall through uh, or work out for us one way or the other, we're gonna make this happen and eventually just it's like it opened up and said, Let's go. Yeah. So we did it. Was there any one thing in particular during the t uh, pandemic time period that was like, This is it, I've had enough? It we moved right as it was kicking off. So we okay. had our, we have our little condo in that UTC area, but then we, we used that with her parents. So it would be like a little vacation home for them. So we went downtown and found a, a, a loft downtown in the gas lamp. And it was nice to live down there. And it's interesting how we decided to pick up, pull out, get back to our condo, move to Sedona, right as those semi riots took yeah. off down there and things started getting boarded up. And we thought we just dodged a bullet. And for us, it just we could feel the timing. It was like that intuition. She's very intuitive. So she's like, I, I got to go now. We, we have to make the move. And, and it, it just it worked out. So we were glad we got out of there. We went back a couple of times and how dead and desolate it was in, the, in those areas. Oh, yeah. You can hop on a highway. And I, I remember driving from downtown to Oceanside to go skydive at Go Jump. And it took me 25 minutes. It was ridiculous. Which people need to understand it should take about six times that long. right that's <laughs> i was in I, yes. so i was yeah. in la i was getting ready to go on joe's show mm. and they locked down la the night that we got in wow and i'm like text i'm like so are we doing this or what buddy and he writes back youtube says we're essential so let's fire it off i have never had an experience like i had driving in la that weekend I think, I think we were there Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We made it from LA to San Diego in about an hour. And that's, I'm, in, that's I, intense. Yeah. That's insane. Because <laughs> you know, like the 405 is, in my right. opinion at least, most of the time a little bit better than the five, but both become fireworms of traffic at some point during Always. the day. And I've also hit traffic in LA at like 2 a.m. You know, Michael, what did you put into these things, by the way? What did you order? I just ordered cold brew with cream. Sweet milk. All right. I was checking. Mm. thought you were trying to get me diabetic over there. Oh, <laughs> absolutely not. Side yeah. note, Michael, do you like almond milk? <clears throat> no. Okay. Do you like oat milk? Yeah, it's better than almond milk, but not preferable. <laughs> How do you milk an oat or an almond? I, I'm uh -oh. pretty sure it's just tea. Pretty much just almond and milk or almond and oat tea. Right. Some questions don't have answers. They do, I digress. Sure. That's all right. Yeah. The fireworm of LA. And I was telling, I was telling my wife, my now wife, like, hey, uh, this isn't what it's like. <laughs> this should take us several hours. Right. I've made that drive in like an hour and a half, and I've also made that drive in six hours, depending right. on what's happening. Same here. Road. Same here. I don't know if there's enough money in the world that would make me go back to that. I agree. I, I truly, if there was a, a table this big, and this is a four-person table for people listening, if it was stacked with gold bars or $100 bills two feet high, I still don't think I would do it. I feel you. I mean, like I might visit to take some of that, sure. but I certainly wouldn't put <laughs> strategically figuring out a, a way to. Bag. Yeah, I would there it is. Duffel bag it up. You got my you got my presence, so I deserve at least a little yeah. bit of this. But yeah, I 100 percent agree with that. What is the <clears throat> population of Sedona? Ten thousand uh, residents and about three million visitors each year. Billion dollar tourist industry. It's, I would say similar to this area as well. We were just talking. I forget why it came up, but somebody was saying they think. In the Flathead Valley, there's about between 100 to 150,000, but that is the town of Whitefish to the east of that, Columbia Falls, mm. 
Kalispell, Big Fork, Summers, and I, and I could buy that, but in the summer months, it has to be five to ten x that. Mm, it's just bet. well with Glacier yeah. National Park just around the corner, Flathead Lake. It's just woof, and they're. I've here. never been here before. This is my very first trip, and as skydivers, we know that word first means beer. But this is yeah. my very first trip here. Hope you didn't bring your rig because there's not a lot of. DCs. No, I didn't. That's why I made the comment of like, too bad. We, yeah. you know, we can't send it, but yeah, I didn't plan. I know I didn't figure there was a DZ at least locally or around here. We do that. I have a, a buddy of mine. I don't. He's former Green Beret who lives down three hours south here. I'm trying to remember exactly where, but everybody I know is starting to consider the mountain towns and yeah. getting the hell out of these populated cities like New York. Los Angeles, San Diego, and so forth. I was just in New York. We finished up the jumping expedition, and yeah. at the tail end of it, there was interest in media. So, I mean, that's where the, the hubs are for those. And my son graduated high school. Uh, he actually pushed a final the day forward. And so he graduated early, and I got him on an airplane and flew him out there because that was on his bucket list. So it's like, hey, man. He, of course, travels with his skateboard. It drives me absolutely <laughs> nuts. He gets on his skateboard, and he'll just ride through the terminals. And it's like, to me... It's like fi- fingers on a uh-huh, yeah. chalkboard. That sound of those weaving wheels, in right. and out of people, right. and I'm just, I'm just like, God, you're gonna <laughs> shin somebody with that board. <laughs> but he's, you know, he's skateboarding through yeah. Central Park, and you know, he I track him on his phone. But he had, he had a pretty good leash. He was there moving around New York City. He's 17 years old. He's doing great. And uh, you know, we're talking about it. And it was an amazing place to visit. And I think there, I mean, the food scene is one thing that is amazing there, and it's lagging here. But I couldn't do it. I couldn't. I don't like that on top of you, concrete jungle, vertical look to get a slice of sky. Agreed. Agreed. It's not good for the soul. I mean, yeah. if you think about it. But think also, about it. but yeah. on the other side of that, the people that live there and they're born and raised there, it, it's probably not a fit for everybody either coming out here. I mean, no. just so people know, we, we do have electricity here, running water, not a big deal. Internet, um, all of the creature comforts, but we have like a Best Buy. If it's not in Best Buy, you're Amazoning it. There, there are go. some grocery yeah. stores, but there's not really any. I mean, I noticed you have a natural grocers right up the road, so there is a, the <sighs> options for a little bit of a bit. <laughs> yeah, if you like things that taste like cardboard, because they take all the unhealthy, <laughs> oh, tasty man. things out of it. Have you ever shopped there, Michael? Yeah, all the time. Yeah, go get a bag of macaroni there or whatever, like uh, mac and cheese from there, and then one from the grocery store. That's like in the blue, and I can't think of the name of it right now. Crap. They taste completely different. Oh, yeah. One's probably better for the than the other, but that's the only kind of like natural grocer option in town. And yeah. it can be, it could be a culture shock. There were a lot of people from Cali and New York that kind of flooded in here. I'm curious because they did it, you know, in a time period where it's, they were making a, a decision and like, hey, we, we have to get out of here as opposed to let's visit for a little bit. Let's check this out. They just right. wanted to flee their situation, which I totally understand. I would want to do the same thing. I, I'll be curious to see how many of them find a, a second place. Like, this is kind of nice, but I need to be outskirts of that's, Denver. That's, I need to be outskirts yeah. of fill yeah. in the blank. That happened in Sedona. I mean, we watched like four influencers moved to town during the pandemic and one of my least favorite words by the way <laughs> my my two fucking but that's the term that we hear around town is these influencers are moving in here and using instagram to you know show their to ruin the town yeah, yeah i get that shit yeah, too i'm sure i'm <laughs> like yeah because the show yellowstone really isn't doing much right it's no, me or yeah. glacier national park people didn't know about I mean, that before what, i moved yeah. here Andy, I, I, I say I'm going to Montana uh, to some some colleagues are, oh yeah I, i've been watching that show it's the first thing out of their mouth i'm yeah. like okay which but, was so, uh, was filmed up until the last season where I think they actually moved it to Montana was filmed in Salt Lake City. Mm. So take it easy, people. Take yeah. it easy. <laughs> <laughs> the ranch is in right. Montana, right? But they were getting tax credits, so they were doing most of it up I in love uh, it. like Park City. I love it. Yeah. Don't believe what you're seeing, folks. Yeah, <laughs> but that's the thing that happened in Sedona is they would move, and we noticed it. Uh, there was a guy I know personally who moved out there, and he left a year later. He sold his home. I mean, he made yeah. like two million dollars on his home when the market just went through the roof. House yeah, prices him. were crazy, but they all they came. They couldn't handle the small town vibe the living in the mountains 10,000 people it's more of a retirement community even yeah. though we've got we've got things to do there there's plenty to do there hiking and bike you know events um, it's so much for people that want that kind of more slow quieter kind of vibe and those people could handle it so they left they went back to San Diego or, or wherever they came from I get the draw of both for yeah. me personally now that I've in Kalispell where we're sitting I, I truly think in the subdivision of where we I used to live out by Skydive San Diego I don't know if you ever jumped out there that's where I got my AFF so the yep. Otay Reservoir yep when I first moved to San Diego, all that housing out there, it wasn't there. 
And there actually wasn't even a DZ out at Otai. When I learned to skydive, it was at Skydive San Diego, but it was at Brown Field. Brown Airfield, okay. And then they yeah. eventually had moved it. And I remember the first time that I drove past it, the housing began miles before where it is now. And I ended up living in that housing. But that area, that subdivision of you know Chula Vista or East Lake, depending on Hamul how- Hamul or whatever, yeah. yeah that's, you you yeah. want to church it up a little bit, it's <laughs> East Lake. Oh, right. The locals are like, yeah, this is Chula Vista. There's more people there in that subsection of San Diego than there are in Kalispell. Hmm. And for me at the phase of the life I was at, it was I don't think I can go back. I've attuned myself a little bit more to and I really appreciate it. Of course. New York, great to visit. Nothing but great experiences there. I can't even fathom doing everything that you would want to do there. In a day we hit the Met, we hit the Natural History Museum, Central Park, Empire State Building, Times Square. Hmm. And like, like you could just go on and on and on and on. We didn't see any of the other boroughs. Like we could have gone and just, it was amazing. Couldn't live there. We'll look forward to going back. It's to way, it's way. I mean, my wife's from Long Island, so, uh, but moved to California to get out of there. Same thing. And um, I've gone there for business. We're working with clients on Wall Street and I like it for the few days that I'm there at a time and I'm ready to get on a plane and yeah. hightail it out of there. But I, again, we're all built differently. We all want our own individual environments or what, what serves us and our power. And that's fine. If you like that thing, go for it. Yeah, but that's why I'm happy to be in the mountains. Even in, you know, being in my forties, it's like, I, I thoroughly enjoy waking up to the red rock views, going hiking every day with my dog, enjoying just the quietness. I can open the door and it's a black sky community and there's just barely any road noise out on 89A and we're good. That's awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. What got you into uh, skydiving? Oh, we're going to go all the way back to the military days? Or, yeah, go yeah, for it. It's, I mean, we'll get there eventually. Uh, yeah, we'll get anyway. there eventually, I'm sure. Um, I always had a fascination with jumping out of airplanes. Uh, every man in my family has served in the military from World War II on. Which branch? Uh, Navy and Army. Okay. So my dad's father was uh, a signalman uh, on D-Day. So he did was responsible for the naval gunfire that pounded the beaches. Uh, my mother's father was Army Air Corps. Uh, my dad was a corpsman right before Vietnam, and then my uncle was Mac B. Sog, which I watched one of your, your recent episodes. With, with John Strecker Meyer? Yeah, absolutely. So I remember my uncle when I was listening to him talk. Yeah, it's I honestly sweet. feel like any one of them that are alive, and especially the ones that have been killed, like, here's your Medal of Honor. I agree with that. The stuff that you were doing. I agree with that. It, it, <clears throat> I remember sitting in team rooms, people were like, yeah, we're pretty badass. Like, <laughs> let's go back in the history books there here a little bit. Those yeah. dudes people just jumping out of Hueys into triple canopy jungle trying to save their buddies. Oh, and by the way, didn't have a gun. We'll just sort that out when we get to the ground. Yeah, figure it out on the way down. Like, I don't know how you walk with balls that size. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I would say that we would talk, we'd have scotch with my, my uncle who was Mac B and we would talk, he would share little just insights, especially. I was going to ask you, how much would he talk about it? Um, when he would get a little tipsy, we would start having it would, it, and it was usually myself, my middle brother who was with 75th Ranger Regiment, my stepdad who was a combat engineer during Desert Storm, and it would just be the four of us, pitch black on the back patio in Temecula, over a jo- bottle of Johnny Walker Blue Label, and yep. then we would get we would get into the combat stories, and we would hear interesting little feats, and we you would feel it in your body, and you're like, you know, I've seen a little bit of stuff in my time and what I've done, but holy mackerel, like the, it's it's mind boggling. It's truly mind boggling. It's a, you look back and especially serving in the in the GWAT era. Yeah, you know, risk assessment and mitigation was a large part of what we did. You know, pow, the countless hours in front of PowerPoint, just doing briefs. But the first page of every brief, it, it here's what we assess the risk to be, and right. depending on the risk, low, medium, high. I don't actually even know what the highest one means. Maybe it would be like <laughs> ridiculous or extreme or something. But it's right. it's your approval level. Sure. Um, you know, like low level, like, hey, you're going to do a, a key leader engagement. You could probably approve that at like an O3 level or personally. But I don't even know how you would write a brief for, okay, here's the idea. We're going to take two Americans on a helicopter. It's piloted by a host nation uh, aviator. We'll take six to ten uh, locals that you're going to work with, and you're just going to go into another sovereign country that we're claiming that we're not in. Right. And maybe you'll come back and maybe you won't. And you have an HF radio. That's, <laughs> there might be some questions as you push that up the chain oh, in I'm the sure. modern era. You said at one point, I think, <laughs> yeah, you'd get laughed out of that briefing room. Oh, and honestly, you're not, that's so true. I mean, I've yeah. heard some stories even with the, the people I served with, with the 101st Airborne Division. It's like, they had thought these recon guys and these snipers like, well, maybe if we tried to do it this way and it's almost like falling on deaf ears, they would never listen to that. And they're like, but I yeah. know I can get it done. It didn't matter anymore. So I think you're right. Times have changed. Those those guys are just uh, 
an echelon above. But um, I completely agree that, that the separation between the things that they were tasked with doing right. and, and were successful doing with the resources that they had and the limited support, whether it be air cover. I mean, there was no Blows ground support. Yeah. Blows my mind. Yeah. I mean, you think about it, you get into a gunfight. And you're 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 grateful you have A10s. You're grateful you have radio and comm guys. Yeah, you, well, I have and, a radio that's the size of this notebook that I can talk on your pocket, satellite right. to. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but uh, and we can keep on that because there's so many cool stories to talk about with. It. But skydiving for me, um, because my uncle jumped, mm -hmm. and the people I talked about, the paratroopers in World War II, I was always infatuated with. But I had a fear of heights. Um, I would have dreams that I was climbing up st stairs in a building and I would panic and I wake up and I thought this is BS. Well, what am I scared of? So I decided to go bungee jumping to get over my fear of heights and I uh, pushed myself to do it. And it's funny that my middle brother who was the ranger um, was scared of heights too. And he actually refused to do the bungee jump that day. We were kids. Uh, so I pushed him aside and did it again the second time. And it really helped to break through that fear of heights and realizing that if I can calm down my mind, get my breath in order and, t and pay attention to what I was instructed to do, I can have a better experience with this thing that's abnormal. So for me, yeah. I fell in love with it. And, I mean, uh, well, now that you have jumped yes, or do jump, you do. know that yeah. bungee jumping is actually a really poor step to get you to skydive because they're completely different. <laughs> it was horrible. They both involve heights yeah. and air quotes, but at bungee jump level, yeah. you can spit and see where you're going to bounce. Skydiving level, I find it to be very abstract. And you look down, and you're like, yeah, I'm pretty high up here, but I don't, I don't have any relative right. measurement other than I can. Look, it looks like a moving topographical map. But at the time, I'm 13, yeah. So I didn't have the ability. I didn't even re realize you could skydive, or that was an industry or sport. And that was the thing I kept saying to my dad: I want to jump. I want to do something to break through this. And he was like, okay. And I would jump off high dive, you know, uh, pool at pools so like those 20 footers, whatever. I said I need something bigger. So we went to a 150 foot thing. And of course, it is more dangerous than jumping out of an airplane. Oh, for sure. But for me, it was the rush that really broke me through that fear that I have no idea where it came from. So then I became even more um, infatuated with jumping out of airplanes, and eventually got to the point where. We did. Uh, we were boxing at a club in East Anaheim because that's where we're from originally. And my dad introduced us to this uh, gunnery sergeant in the Marine Corps, Ed Costick. I'll never forget him. And he said, um, "Yeah, I run this program called uh, Devil Pups, and it's a junior Marine Corps program. Now it's a place where Andy they they send troubled kids and they send other kids that want to learn military structure and have a drive to go into the military. So it's kind of like it's a an interesting mix, dis disciplinary slash get your feet wet with." Yeah. The military world. So we trained for 12 weeks with this guy at the old El Toro Marine Base right there in Irvine with those big hangars. Yeah. Uh, every weekend with training PT, uh, just learning the basics. Uh, and then we, they sent us to Camp Pendleton for two weeks and we lived in those Quonson huts. And I realized, wow, okay, I never paid attention to the military this way, but this is this feels good. This feels right. And then my brother and I started talking. And we're like, what do you want to do? I, I don't want to be a Marine Marine. And he goes, neither do I. I. I just don't like the thing. And my brother said, well... I think I want to go to butts. And I said, okay, well, I want to go to jump out of airplanes in the army and go to ranger school. That's, we were like, okay, let's make a pack. We're going to go do that. And, um, I started just looking into different airborne type operations and things like that. And, uh, joined the military not too long after that and wanted to go to airborne school, but needs of the army kept doing some weird shit. It's funny how that works. Uh, funny how that works. I had it in my contract when I joined, I got out of boot camp where well, I graduated boot camp, turned blue as an inf light infantryman. Um, I know, and Mike talk, Glover talks is, about it. <laughs> what does turn blue mean? It's turn blue that you it's, you become a basic infantryman. You get okay. that blue cord that they wear on their the right shoulder. Okay. Uh, and you, so when you get that, then they say, hey, you guys, you have airborne contracts, come with us. And they take us to Fort Benning, and then we go in downtown and take our physicals and our exams for airborne school. And I got excited. I'm like, okay, if I get into airborne school now, since it's in my contract and I graduate, and the, our, the RIP instructors come up, I'm going into RIP. That's where I want to go. But when we got done and got back to the barracks and we were getting ready to fully just be done and graduate and get ready to get our orders, they came up to us, pulled us aside and said, hey, we've got West Point cadets that need to graduate. They have to get pushed through airborne school and get to ranger school because they have to get to their units to serve. Are you willing to forego your slot and stay in the Army? I love how they phrased it that way. It was are you willing to? That was, are you willing to? It's like a drill sergeant in your face at 18 years old going, are you willing to? Like, what are you supposed to say to that? And you go, well, regardless of what you say, you're going to be willing to. There's where you're going to end up, and then there's the right. facade of the choice that they give you. <laughs> that's the voluntold yeah. model, right? Oh, you're not willing to? Yeah, guess what? Yeah, you're still, you're still doing, doing it. it. Yeah. So it was interesting because instead of getting mad, I thought, well, where am I going? And I'm the only one out of my platoon in boot camp that got Fort Campbell. The only one. And I said, well, hey, at least you're getting air assault. And I thought... Okay, what is aerosol and repelling out of helicopters? Cool, I'll go do that. So I kind of just sucked it up and dealt with it and got to that unit. And then uh, 
I volunteered. I was with the battalion mortars, uh, 81s, for a little bit um, in that platoon. And I, I kind of didn't like the leadership that was there. I didn't feel like I was getting to expand my horizons as a soldier. I showed up as an E2. I wanted to learn. I wanted to grow and be a better soldier. And I wanted to get to these schools. And I um, walked in one day. They said, hey, we need a volunteer. I just raised my hand. I didn't have no idea why I did that. I just did it anyway. Hey, you're going to Kosovo with 1st Battalion. Perfect. Get the hell out of here. Took some leave, transferred over to Kosovo, uh, over the 1st Battalion, excuse me, uh, and went to Kosovo and enjoyed that. It was my first taste of being around hostile forces. Uh, mm -hmm. We did like a, uh, I was invited as a mortarman on a Bravo team, 11 Bravo team, to go do a covert reconnaissance mission into Serbia, where there was a demilitarized zone. Yep. And there was only 10-man teams, so we humped it in for like seven hours, set up a perimeter, five guys on one side, five guys on the other, put camo nets up, had booty caps the whole nine yards, just stripped down and got into our basic combat gear, and uh, for like five, six hours, nothing happened. And eventually... We heard some noises, and it was amazing how I, it, I, 20 years old, experiencing that that very first intense situation for the next 12 hours. Uh, and when I got home, I thought that was amazing. I want to stay in, and I want to keep going and see what I'm capable of. So I reenlisted, and it's funny. What year is this? 2000. I went to Kosovo. Okay, the whole almost the whole year, 2000. And when I got home, I got promoted E4 a little early because of what I uh, accomplished over there. And when I got home, I said, "Well, okay." We did our EIB. I got my EIB expert infantryman's badge for those who are listening. I uh, had that air assault. Um, I thought, you know what? I, now is a chance for me to go to airborne school since we're talking about skydiving. And I said, I want to reenlist. They're like, great. How many more years? I'll do a minimum of three. But if you give me my airborne slot, I'll do four to five. You let me know. So they came back and they're like, well, we're trying our best. And they wasted like, <laughs> I thought, you got to be joking me right now. <laughs> I just did a deployment. You're asking, you're saying, okay, Stay in with us. I'm, I'm going to give you more of my life. And the only thing I want from the army is airborne school. For God's sakes, I'm watching Pogues go to airborne school. Hey, they're trying their best. I know they do. That's what I was their, laughing their about. Best. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I had such a spectacular experience in the military. Like, I loved it. But just little phrases like that. We're going to do everything we can. And you just leave those meetings or that conversation knowing that they have already forgotten what you asked oh. them to do before you're out the door. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's gone. And you know what they do? They come back and they, they, they gaslight you. Constantly gaslighting you. Oh, yeah, we're working on that. Same thing happened with my promotion board packet. We're working on that. Um, but they came back and said, hey, look, this is where we're at, the needs of the Army. And I thought, oh, here we go again. And I went, you know what, screw it. I, I, I want to stay in it. And if I stay in, I have an opportunity. I'm going to just stay in and push. Yeah. So I did. I stayed in. And then we went to JRTC again for my second time, which is Fort Polk, Louisiana. And anybody that has not served in the military, it's probably one of the worst places I've ever been in the military. I'd rather go back to Iraq. Um, I don't know why. It's just that swampy, cold, miserable place. And we went there. We started training. And then I put, <laughs> Andy, I love this. I put in for uh, pre-ranger. And my first one said, great. Myself and another guy, Ron Silvoy, who ended up going to battalion. Him and I started training. We would do ruck runs, five-mile ruck runs, try to beat 35 minutes with boots on. We would just train every single day outside of the unit and eventually got to the point where because I was in charge of the 60 section that I was in, they were like, well, we can't afford to lose you right now, so can you hold off again on the ranger school dreams and go later? And then September 11th happened. Yeah. And was like, okay, now I'm not going anywhere. But what am I going to do? I'm just going to deal with it. The entire time, I was like, I wish I was jumping out of airplanes. I wish I was at a unit, a soft unit. I wish I was joining my brother down a ranger bat. I wish I was doing these things. And then eventually got to the point where um, after I got out of the military, I wanted to pursue skydiving. I started looking into it and started studying it, figuring out what, would, what it would take. Um, and eventually got to the point where I decided just to pull the trigger and go down to Skydive San Diego and yeah. do AFF. And I love it. Been Were doing you? it eight years shocked by the low barrier to entry people don't Jeez believe me Louise, man. people will say hey how long did it take you to get qualified <laughs> to jump on your own and i say sit down because i'm going to tell you a tale <laughs> a tale of me going into skydive san diego yeah. on friday yeah and jumping on my own on sunday <laughs> it's true <laughs> it's it's the barrier to entry you would have to you'd have to trip over something before you got to it before Otherwise, it's impossible to trip over. I mean, there are people that struggle with certain aspects of it, but it's at least when I went through, it was ground school, which I think we knocked out in four days on the Friday, did a jump that day, and then did, I think, four in three the following yeah, days. It that makes a sense. a total of seven or eight jumps, depending on your performance. Yep. Depending, depending on your performance. And then yeah. they're like, hey, here's our rental gear, and this is what a jump ticket costs. Yeah. Do you want to keep jumping? And the answer, of course, was yes. Yeah. It's low. It's low. I showed up on a Saturday morning, 8 o'clock. Um, got in the class. We did it in four and a half hours, the, uh, the yeah, ground school. Right. And we were, we were up in the air and uh, jumping. Um, I, uh, I think I had one of my first instructors was a seal and, uh, Larry was his name. I'm trying to remember, but, um, Barbie arrow. 
It's probably his last name, Bold. Yep. Yeah, I worked with him at uh, second phase of Bold. So yeah. he was um, he was my very first, and, and him and another guy were my very first instructors that held on to me. And I, man, I left that airplane. It's like, <laughs> this is good. I yeah. like this. The freedom that I felt, and then I'm in control when I pitch yeah. or pull the pilot shoot. For those that don't know what pitch is, uh, just was exhilarating. And I crushed my. I had a business trip right after that, so I told my wife I'm gonna knock out AFF in the next few days because we got to drive to Scottsdale. It's the way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. It's the way to so. do it. Regardless, it's uh, it's the same as people learning how to fly. Like, okay, I'm going to do a lesson every two weeks mm. for fill in the blank, and it's not that that's impossible. Um, but if you did a lesson every day for a month, you'd probably be done. If you do a lesson every other week, it's probably going to take you a year. Right. Pick and choose. You know, yeah. for some people, it's econ- an economic boundary. For others, it's time. But I have, I always find that those skills and learning. The more compressed that I can do it, the better off it is for me as well. Well, this sport, as you know very well, um, is you have it's almost like you have perishable uh, uh, skill sets if you don't do it enough. If you're not consistent or current, as we say, it's not almost it, as if it is. It is yeah. if you if you don't stay current and you don't have that sustainable uh, momentum with it, you can lose what you've learned, and it does feel weird trying to get back into that stuff. There are certain yeah. things in our lives that we have to absolutely stay consistent with, especially when it comes to doing high risk jobs or high risk, you know, events or sports or whatever it might be. So, so eight years you've been at it. Yeah. I just hit my eight year, uh, January 10th. How many jumps you got now? 700 last four years have been a little bit. That's not bad. Slow for most people. You know, if you don't work in the sport, a mm. hundred jumps a year is, is a pretty good number. Yeah. 50 people. hours in the tunnel. That helps too. That, yeah. I mean, I, that came around, I think the first tunnel that I ever got into was actually, it was the old Fort Bragg tunnel, which to my understanding, they basically took a horizontal tunnel that they used to test, or that was designed around, you know, where they'll, uh, they'll introduce the smoke and they'll test like the land yeah, or oh, flow yeah. of wings or cars. Right, right. They're like, well, what if we put this on its end? And so it worked, but it was just really inefficient. That's interesting. Really inefficient. Then it was not a, you know, the current like iFly systems that are totally, you know, recirculating, climate controlled, multiple turbines. So I went from that, and then the first civilian tunnel I ever got into was in Eloy. But man, you want oh, to talk that, about a game changer. Yeah. yeah. I, I, that's the thing is because I live in Sedona, Eloy is my obviously my local drop zone. I don't go to – I've done Buckeye a few times. I haven't been to Skydive Phoenix. I don't think you can fun jump there. But I haven't been either. Um, I do go down, and I'll, I'll do 15 minutes in the tunnel in Eloy. And then go jump, do three jumps, four jumps right yep. afterwards, just kind of keep that consistency going. But it is amazing because b- b- the difference between the product of the iFly and the Eloy Sky Ventures is obviously the recirculating temperature yeah. controlled versus not. And then when it's cold, yeah, you're trying to learn and train in the tunnel when it's freezing cold and your hands or are raining frozen. outside or raining outside, sucking the rain, the rain in. in. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a pain. Yeah. It's a pain. So um, still a anyway. great tool, though. Phenomenal too. That's what tool. That's why I invest in it and I enjoy it because I want to go when I jump with friends. Uh, I want to be able to fly. I'm, I'm a free flyer. That's kind of my focus. I was going to ask you yeah. for discipline. Yeah. I you know I, I never got into the wingsuiting, which nothing wrong with that. If friends have tried it. They they don't like it. Some love it. Obviously, this is you know what you do as well. But uh, I love flying on my head. I love carving around the sky with people and 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 linking up and having a good time, just figuring out new dive flows and and experience that. And I'm just glad I'm doing it now. I just wish I, I would have done it sooner. Yeah. And I I wish that and military would have stopped bullshitting me and let me jump out of planes. It's one of the activities, but, um, though, if you are <clears throat> if you set some parameters and boundaries for yourself, yeah. it's not that high of an impact. That's another question I will get asked a lot is, you know, how how hard are the landings? Mm. And if you, even under like a, the sport canopy, when I'm current, that I'll jump is a VK84. Okay. And that canopy is, it's aggressive. Yes. Um, and I probably will never go smaller than that one just because I don't want to dedicate that much time to being current. But at my weight, I start playing around with a, you know, a, a suspended weight ratio that's eh. What are you loaded at? Uh, I mean, if I'm two and change, 225 oh, with wow. all of my gear on, close to three to one. Three to one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. So wing loading, you know, at some point the math math is what math is. But even on that canopy, when I'm current and you initiate your turn at the right time and you obviously want to land into the wind <laughs> – but flare, it's just like boop. It's like stepping off a less than one of the steps going down from the right. studio. If you can keep yourself in those boundaries and you learn how to pack appropriately and you maintain your gear well, like I've watched people jump, and you're looking like, hey man, I can like almost see through your slider. Like it's a mesh slider. You could use that for base jumping if you wanted to. I'm like, oh, my neck hurts. I'm like. I'm not an expert, but do you want me to like yeah. lay some breadcrumbs <laughs> out here for you that maybe could explain your neck pain? But if you don't do that. I know people who have skydived well into their 70s. Yeah. I hope to do the same. 
Yeah. But I, you know what I've noticed with that, that kind of mindset, it, that's how they operate in life in general. That I'll get to it later or I can squeeze another jump out of it. I heard someone say I can squeeze another jump out and they literally had a high, high performance malfunction Yeah, and nearly went in. And it's yeah, like, what's that worth? It's like, yeah. if you're going to start, like how many, how many zeros do I need to write on a check to not, you know, like, like, Oh, a canopy, a brand new high performance canopy is a couple thousand bucks, mm. a ride <laughs> in life flight. And you have to have your lower body put back together with an erector set probably more expensive i've never done that but i'm going to assume half a million million bucks probably oh then the time away from work <laughs> right the lack of, of mobility how's right. the rest of your life going to be it's like, just well, deal with that stuff up front right and that's i mean I'm, I'm speaking from a little bit of experience because i shattered both my wrists in a motorcycle wreck and i had plates and screws in both my wrists and it was nearly street or dirt street full others tree branch oh really yeah in orange county so it's uh, we, going all over the topic here with that it it is interesting just what realized that my preparation for riding motorcycles, sport bikes, that's how my wife and I met. We both ride Jicks for 750s. And we were, you know, she's a knee dragger, completely just really enjoyed in that sport. But I had a tree branch, not anything else. Riding up the road one night, I'd sold my bike. I was going to buy a newer model, took hers out for a ride. And I was in Garden Grove near the 22 freeway and um, took off from a light. And a few seconds later, there was a huge tree branch in my face and it flipped me and threw me 100 feet through the air. And I woke up in hospital. And, um, they said, hey, if I hadn't been wearing my leathers and I hadn't been wearing my undersuit and my boots and my gloves and my, you know, awry helmet and the whole nine yards, I would yeah. be dead. So for me, I go back to what you just said is the preparation for those moments that you, you don't want to happen. You're hoping never happen, but could happen, especially when you're in a high risk environment or sport or anything you're doing in your life. When you're challenging yourself, it's all about slowing down just to make sure if you're it's like why override I see it all the time. Why are you overriding little things like your slider being out of whack or yeah. your lines being a little bit too burned? And you're like, well, maybe I, maybe nothing. Go get it inspected and do the right thing. Yes, it's going to cost you a little more money. But again, what's it worth? I know because my my risks from that experience were almost $400,000 of hospital bills to build. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. So I understand even being prepared. Look yeah. what happened after 10 days staying in the hospital and five surgeries. Thank goodness that's all it, that, it, that happened to me was the risk. But I take that constantly in the state, even when the military is saying, always preparing your gear, always making sure you maintain your, 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 your status with it, cleaning it properly, stowing it properly, paying attention to it. I think we get too complacent as human beings and things we do, especially when we, a lot of skydivers this, are this way, when they get really, they get good, they kind of have that Dunning-Kruger effect. Yeah. And then tragedy happens. Same thing with parameters you talk about. When I fly my canopy, I have a Crossfire 2 129, been on it for 300 jumps, yeah. not going anywhere anytime soon. Loaded at 17, good enough for me. When it's no wind, it's fast. Sometimes I'll pull a little front riser stuff to get a little bit more speed, but I stay in my perimeters of making sure that I'm getting coaching. I'm constantly paying attention to my surroundings, yeah. situational awareness, and when I land, if I don't like what I'm feeling on my base leg, I do not try anything. And I just land wherever I got to go land. So, Yeah, the, the motorcycle one is, is it's a good parallel. I, I ride bikes too. I am by no means like a knee dragger. I just really enjoy <laughs> motorcycles. Right. But I dress for the crash not for the ride and it's amazing how many people dress for the ride and not the crash right and and reality is math is in your favor most of the time on bikes sure you know the catastrophic worst case scenario was the tree branch attached to a tree or just it fell out of a tree oh. it was a rotted the city was responsible for that so i they covered my medical oh, wow. bills because it's called foreseeable future in their their bylaws. When they have medians with trees, they have to maintain them because of public roads. And that rotted out sycamore in the middle of that tree off Westminster and Harbor Boulevard, basically they, they were two months behind taking care of it. And it fell. It yep. was a hundred pound branch. And, and it you ended up on the wrong perfect side of timing. statistics. Absolutely. But most people will never encounter that. And the mistake I think they make is I'm gonna dress for that. And it you know, here in Montana it gets it's pretty warm in the summertime. And I'm like, fuck. All right, I'm going to put on the right pants. I'm going to put on the right boots. I'm always going to wear a jacket with the uh, appropriate skid plates in it. I'm going to wear gloves. I'm going to throw the helmet on. And you're sweating a little bit before you get on the bike. Absolutely. And you're way safer in case the worst case scenario comes, which I don't ever want it to. And I ride super conservatively. And I'm actually not worried about on bikes. I'm, I'm never worried about my own ability on the bike. I'm worried about somebody not seeing me. There it is. Because yeah. every time I've almost been hit and I've never laid a bike down, a street bike. I've laid down every dirt bike I've ever had, <laughs> to include the one last summer, my multi, my dual sport bike, laid that oh, fucker man. right down, jumped right over the handlebars, nah. the forward roll, not a big deal. Practice some jiu-jitsu all the time. I hate warm-ups. But Preparation. Yeah. It's, it, 
pisses me off. My wife teaches jujitsu and I go to her classes. And I hate the fucking warm. I hate them. And we do forward rolls and backward rolls. And I actually think I told her I did a forward roll. She's like, see, that's why. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> we found the one instance where it worked out. Oh, uh, yeah. But, Confirmed her case. Yeah, yeah but it's. <clears throat> I'm worried about people not being able to see me. The two times that I've almost been just completely nuked on a bike with somebody coming from the far extreme lane thinking they were going to miss their exit and diving all the way across traffic. And I was, you know, was, I'm yeah. getting on the freeway and they're like, I have to get off. Yeah. So it changed the way that I ride. I give myself distance. I control speed and, you know, and distance. I ride the way that I ride and I try to get everybody out of the equation. And even though I'm totally comfortable with my riding ability, I have every single piece of gear on that I possibly can because I don't know when that tree is going to come and maybe it never will come, but I'd rather be a little bit sweaty. Right. Then wake up one day in the hospital and look, like not have hands or something. Yeah, and I didn't. Yeah. I didn't have hands for three months. And thank goodness I have a good wife. Yeah. But that is even being prepared. Things can happen. Likely not going to, like you said, to you, but why not be prepared? And that yeah. just spills out to everything that you you do in life, especially when you're saying, hey, look, here's what I really want. I want to achieve skydiving. I want to be able to be a good motorcycle rider. I want to be a good operator in the military. I want to be, run a business successfully. But that requires all facets of your life to be operating from a place of preparation, attention to detail, situational awareness. And these are pieces that people compartmentalize in their lives and they wonder why they have failure over after failure and actually end up hurting themselves, whether it's physical, mental, emotional, and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah. Coming from the family that you did was military service expected how was it talked about internally you know i look back i thought about it before you and i even got on the show today um i was like you know figure that question would come i don't it wasn't really a an expected thing but it was talked about at family functions um my grandfather my dad's dad i should say um would never he he would he wouldn't watch saving private ryan because uh, that's just what he was there he doesn't need to see that but he would never talk about it it was just never his thing. He was just never one of those. One of the most common narratives I've heard from like World War II vets. Right. Just never did. I think one time he told my dad that a German U-boat was searching for survivors and he was in a, in a life raft with one of his lieutenants and the lieutenant went to sit up and he had to pull him down. You know what would happen if they would have found him. So that's the only thing I think I heard from my father growing up. But it was just kind of in the background, people talking about military service war. Um, my dad didn't go to Vietnam, mm. but every other man that, I've been around in my family went to war of some sorts. Um, so for, for my brothers and I, and then I had a younger brother who ended up being a corpsman, FMF Greenside corpsman with the Marines. And I think he went back in recently as a, a commission officer, or medical doctor, surgeon. They sent him to medical school. Yeah, it's a great uh, program that they right, have. Right, absolutely. I figured. Um, he got his, you know, his laboratory technician stuff. So he was, he made fun of that. He was always checking the pee and the blood of the Marines out in uh, Paris Island. Somebody has to. Somebody has to. <laughs> but he got back into it that way. But my brothers and I thought, you know what? We don't know what we really want to do with our lives yet. I think that that's what also really spurred the decision to do it. Part of the other aspect of what pushed me into the military was the fact that I was a baseball player for 13 years. My dad was a semi-pro ball player. I grew up around pro athletes. My dad's friends with Rod Carew. All these guys were always around us. So he had it in his mind, the vicariously lived through my, his son that had the arm, the oldest of three boys, to be the pitcher. So I was always on a mound, t-ball and so forth, little league all the way into high school. How's your elbow? Mm, I worked it out. Yeah. Shoulder, elbow. Yeah, I was going to say, there's a little bit of a tension that builds up when you huck a baseball that many times. Especially when you're thrown in the 80s. It gets yeah. really... Um, I was always wearing something to keep it warm in games and even off season. But it got to the point where the outside pressures that he expected me to be this baseball player, even though we played some football and some soccer, started to wax and wane my mindset. It started to make me feel stressed. and started. Uh, I started to not like the the love of the game anymore. And I remember in high school, um, after the Junior Marine Corps program, Devil Pups, um, I just said, you know what? I want to do something wild and different for myself. And I started riding bulls. I got into rodeo and started competitively doing that where I was traveling around California. And I actually started right. My very first ride was at Lake Elsinore, right down the street from Skydive Elsinore. Really? Yeah. Right off Bundy Canyon Road, uh, off the, the 15 freeway. How do you get started in bull riding? Oh, man. That is a good question. It's interesting. We had a guy in our school who had a cowboy hat he would come to, and I always see him walking back past uh, us in the quad. And I thought, who was that guy? So I started talking to him. And he said, hey, I'm, you know, my family are um, generational ranchers, and you know we're here in California. We got property out in Temecula, Corona. Um, and I, I just love country. I said, okay, great. So I started kind of hanging around him and some other people. And he introduced me to some older 
people he knew, some uh, of his brother's friends that were pro cowboys. And that's basically where I kind of got my indoctrination into the rodeo world. And I fell in love with it. I felt the seductiveness of those guys and their grit and their, their ability to face fears and step into those unknowns that rodeo does provide you. So when I got on my first bolt at 16 years old, in Lake Elsinore, um, and I felt everything inside me ignite at once. I thought, this is the environment I want to be in. I don't want to do what my family expects of me. I want to do what I am creating, what I feel good with. And I leaned into bull riding heavily and started to move away from baseball. And it pissed my dad off. And it got to the point where he didn't like the rebellion nature of me doing that. And uh, he had an army recruiter sit at our, <laughs> our dinner table one day. And as I walked through the door, and I was like, oh, I'm glad you're here. I've been thinking about that too. So it was like a perfect serendipity, huh. serendipitous, excuse me, kind of a moment where he wanted to get rid of me and I was ready to leave too. What do they put you on before a bull? I got on nothing before. Do you ride like a German Shepherd for a bit and then they get you on a Great Dane? Does uh, a dude get down on all fours and he like wiggles around? Like there's got to be some level of hey, education, A, B, C, or is it full send straight onto a bull's back? It's education. What I got was education for a couple hours and then full send. But I didn't get put on the back of a ranked, as they call it, a ranked animal. And, yeah. and anybody that doesn't know rodeo, they have ranking systems for the types of livestock that these companies raise for rodeo cowboys. So they have, you know, the, the A, B, C, D, T teams. So they got a bull that could buck for me, but it wasn't one that was wild and out of control. It was enough for me to get the experience. They were very mindful of that. When you're a brand new rodeo cowboy, they're not going to put you on the back of uh, this PRCA rated professional rodeo bull that will, will wreck a cowboy in, a, in two jumps. I would watch that though. Yeah. If they did. Yeah. I'm not saying that's a show for everybody. It's, I'm, I'm there for it. Dunning Kruger again. There were guys that were a couple years into the sport who were walking around with the macho look, you know, to impress the girls. And I'm 16 watching them kind of going, ah, you can just tell those guys the arrogance. And they would, they would draw something that was wild and they wouldn't, you know, um, call it. You can back out and say, I don't want to ride that bull. And they would get on and they get hurt. They get hurt right in front of us. And then we'd have to stop the. Yeah. Event. How many Kevlar vests were they wearing at the time and helmets? No helmets. I mean, cowboy a cowboy hat is basically the same thing I've been told, you know, <laughs> really molded <laughs> to your head. Yeah, it's now, molded remember, to your head. Yeah. I remember watching yeah. rodeo stuff when I was younger, only because I watched a little bit of it recently. And I'm very thankful for the change that I saw. We're talking like face shield helmets. Yeah. Smart. You know, you know, front coverage, obviously, it's a little bit more of a mesh, but the Kevlar vests that they're wearing, it's the same thing as absorbing the ballistic shock of a round. Absolutely. You know, and, and uh, one of the, what would that, I guess it would be an announcer, or whatever they particularly, a narrator or whatever they call it in that sport, was talking about the the differences in injuries since they have introduced that. I mean, something as simple as, they're probably, most of them we're wearing is, of course, a plaid shirt. Yeah. With some fucking bedazzled jeans. But like, hey, whatever. If you're going to ride a bull, you can wear a bedazzled jeans, sir. I'm not saying yeah. shit to Look you. Look good first. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, just throw a vest on there. Mm -hmm. And the number of lives that it saved, you watch some of those slow-mo videos Oh my goodness. Mind boggling, isn't it? Well, you just see that muscled yeah. animal and the hook the person first off is flying half the time unconscious. <laughs> right. They land and both of the bull's rear legs are just coming over and then directly onto the vest and the guy's okay. Yep. Especially when they're if they're knocked out. Now yeah. their body's limp. So they're not really rigid when that happens and they break. I would the prefer to not experience it either way. Right. But yeah, yeah. either way. Well, and it hurts because that first ride, I it was like a light rainy you know, afternoon in Lake Elsinore, you know how that goes there. And it was a little muddy in the, the arena. And when we came out, I lasted like two and a half seconds, surprisingly. And I thought, well, this is great. And when I came off the left side of him, I hit the ground. He slipped and rolled onto my leg for a second and he turned in to get up. And when he turned to look it up, it was like we locked eyes. And I thought, I got to get the hell out of here. So I, I made started, poor life choices. <laughs> I mean, eject, eject, <laughs> eject, eject. Exactly. <laughs> and I, I'm crawling. My buddies were saying, like, you look like this. You were crawling on hands and knees across the dirt. I've never seen you move faster. And when I got out, I had this huge Charlie horse and bruise down my thigh. And I sat there and like, do you want to, do you like it? Do you want to do it again? I was like, I love it. I, I, this pain is good. Let what was the worst again. spill you took off one of those animals? Um, I was actually in the army when this happened. Uh, I was on leave 21 days. And it was um, prior to Afghan, right before Afghanistan. Uh, six months, and I'm recalling this in these these details because I went down to a little jackpot, uh, South Tennessee area, with some friends. I'm, my buddy, who's the told you lived out here in Montana, was a Green Beret, and um, this bull 
they told me he was going to go to the right. He's always goes the when it opens up, goes to the right. Lean into it. You got to learn how to ride the bull. Bull riding is eighty percent legs, twenty percent upper body. You got to learn how to that makes sense. Yeah, you got to learn how to keep yourself connected to that animal. And when they jump, they call it posting. It's where you squeeze your legs and you lift yourself up off the rope as you keep your head and your eyes focused down on a very specific point of that animal's back. So that you create this center of balance with yourself. And then with your hand that's tied to the rope, and then your free arm. Your free arm is the the additional balance that you have with it. And when they tell you, it's kind of like playing a sport. Um, you know, the, the batter tends to hit home runs right here on the inside. Don't, don't throw to the inside. You don't throw to the inside. With bull riding, the same thing. They say, this animal tends to go this way out of the chute. He goes to the right. He's going to go to the right. This is a good ride for you. you. I mean, if you win the jackpot, it's like 1500 bucks. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm a soldier. I can use a little extra cash. Yeah. Um, so I was doing good. I had my first two rides were great, and I, I covered them, which is eight seconds, and I felt really excited about it, and I got in this bull, and uh, something felt wrong. And I did not trust my gut, my intuition. And I said, screw it. I, you know, I want to do it. I'm, I'm already in the energy. I feel like I'm, I'm in the zone. And he came out and he's going to go right. And when he went right, he, the way he leaned into that turn to the left instantly, his back legs lifted up over the top of him. And then he, then he went right. It's, he didn't go right first. So he almost counter whipped me. And when he came back to the right, he slammed me so hard on the ground and fractured my L4. But Fuck. I didn't know it at the time. I had a, hum, a lumbar hematoma on my back. And I'd crawled away and I was like, okay, I'm hurt. And I laid there. And when I got, got back to my, my friend's house, we were just assessing the situation and she was a nurse and she goes, I don't know if this is good. Um, you might want to tell your command that, you know, you need to go see the medics. And I did. So I, I cut my leave short and I started my therapy, but I only fractured. It was like a hairline in the body of the vertebra and I didn't break anything else, which I'm fortunate. Yeah. And I was still able to train. I was getting therapy and I'm still able to go do PT and, but it was light. It was like I had to. It wasn't was, catastrophic though. No, not enough to, I mean, they, they were a little irritated at me, but they didn't, you know, I, they didn't go, you're a shit bag, you know, get the hell out of here. It was just like, Hey, why did you, eh, I get your, you're trying to do wild shit when you're off duty, but don't ever do that again. And I quit writing after that it was six years later. I quit writing. How so? You have the free hand. Yeah. How tight is your other hand? Because uh, I again, Ooh. my only experience with rodeo is watching people prep people uh, on TV. Watch yeah. it, and it seems like they're cinching and bringing it over, cinching and bringing it over, yeah. as, almost as if even if you were to open your hand, it's still not going. You're anywhere. not. Go, it's not going anywhere. Well, that's the thing is the, we have this rock substance called rosin and it's it comes in these forms of these rocks yellow or black and you can crush it up and then you rub it into your rope with your glove and then you do it enough times with friction it creates heat and stickiness so that supports your ability to keep your hand inside the handle of the rope and you have this pad underneath it and you have this nice handle that has different types of leather built into or s stitched into that handle when you put your hand in there and you're sitting on the back of the animal you're almost back off of the rope probably a good foot sitting back waiting. And then the cowboys that are up on top of the chute with you are helping you cinch down that rope against that animal's body. And they are literally putting their feet and their bodies into that. And that animal feels it. And when oh, it's getting, sure. oh, it's, I've had bulls inside chutes have leaned into my leg and won't get off my leg. And it takes three cowboys to push them off the leg. I've had bulls jump backwards in the chute to try to throw me and then come straight forward. And I almost hit my face on the pole and break my face. And it's just... And you get excited in a way where you're like, okay, I, I know what I'm doing here. I'm on a live animal that weighs 1,500 pounds, and this thing will kill me if it wants to, but I'm going to do it anyway. So that rope gets cinched down so tight, they tie it to the point where your hand is crushed inside this handle, and then you grab the excess, and you wrap it around your hand, <laughs> lace it through your fingers, kind of sit it off the side, and then you that's that moment where you go, it's time to jump. You know, and you just tell them when you're ready to ride, you even nod your head. Okay, boys is like the, everybody says that. You say, okay, boys, when you're a cowboy, it's like, okay, the movies glorify that shit. But at the end of the day, we nod our heads. Yeah. Tell them, let's go open it, you know, one way or the other. And when the door opens, you just, everything goes quiet. It's absolutely the most serene experience that I think I've ever had that nothing else matters. I'm so focused and so connected to that animal. It's quiet. Eight seconds feels like a minute. But when you come off that bull, I've had, I've been hung up a couple of times. And Meaning you were off the bowl and your damn hands so, in there? So tight, Andy. It's You ask if it comes out. And eject, sometimes eject, it, I'm eject. trying to eject. <laughs> and I'm roll. And the worst time I've ever been hung up, I rolled over the top of my hand. And my leg, it's almost like my leg rolled over the top of my hand. Oh, and I'm underneath holding on to this animal that's bucking through my own legs, breathing and just surrendering to that. And then praying to whatever is out there that I get thrown loose. And again, I got thrown loose, but my arm felt like somebody tried to rip it out of the socket. So, oh, that's so weird. I wonder why. I, felt I wonder like why. That. You know, but, 
but thank goodness no no breaks. But that's the thing is those are those moments that you, again going back to what we talked about even with skydiving is we are constantly training and preparing, and then in those moments you're learning how to adapt to that situation when things go bad. Um, but they have training tools like barrels. They'll tie barrels to ropes. And they'll have oh, I've seen this. Seen actually. that before? Yeah. They'll tie barrels to ropes, and then they'll have you sit on it with your own bull riding gear, and then they'll move that barrel around in wild ways to get you to learn your balance, to learn your stabilization, and then you'll learn about the animals, the the, the type of company, and the rough stock they raise, and it's all just a strategic mathematical approach to another wild sport. So, what is it about a cowboy that can make them world class? Like the people at the top of the mm. PBR, like. At the, at the top of the pyramid, what is it that separates them from everybody else? A relentless commitment to their excellence, their craft. Um, nothing distracts them. Their mindset. It's their mindset. It's their ability to embrace the chaos of every moment that they're involved in that sport. Um, they are they are unwavered by the goals that they set for themselves and their de- determination and commitment to get to that goal, no matter what. They it's the, they will endure uh, injuries and setbacks and you know um, controversy in their lives, whatever. It, it doesn't matter to them. And I you know I had a couple guys I rode with who became pro cowboys. Um, one went to the PRCA and became an NFR sensation his first few years. Zach Brown was his name. I used to hang out with this guy and we would go ride together. Um, he was from the outback of Australia. So it was just, just a relentless mindset. I mean, he had a hand hand shake that was like an iron fist. Oh, so he would ride, he rode Bronx, bareback horses and bulls. So that was his two event, uh, specialty, but those guys at the top, just like anybody that's elite in anything they do, it's a relentless commitment to excellence. It is a desire to embrace things that scare the shit out of them to face, uh, the, uh, the uncomfortable truths about maybe where their limitations are facing fears. That's the experience that I, I know for a fact, even when doing the work I do and who I, you know, this very well, this is one of the things is if you're not willing to step towards things that scare you and challenge you, you're never really going to grow. You're not going to expand your capacity and you're not going to experience those goals you say you want for yourself. And that's why those guys at the top in that world or any other world are the best is because they are unwilling, uh, to, to slack in anything they do. I mean, it's hard for me to have any level of judgment for their choices because I recognize I have atypical hobbies. But I tell you what, when mm. I when I think about that level of commitment and again, what I know from just a passing glances at that mm. world, I mean, what does 50, 60, 70 look like for those guys? I mean, they I, I've yet to hear. I think Ty Murray is like one of the few yeah. names that I know. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know him that well, but his list of injuries that he sustained when he was younger. And again, I have I would never talk somebody out of chasing their dream. It's like, damn. I mean, well, look at his <sighs> buddy, um, uh, Tough Hedeman, who was Lane Frost. That you know, story about Lane Frost, eight seconds. Tough Hedeman would rode Bodacious, was one of the biggest, most fearsome bulls in the entire circuit back in the day. And that bull, it looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger bulls. I mean, things built this white. Beast. He was the liver king of bulls. Liver. <laughs> that's a good. <laughs> that's a good one. Um, it's all natural. Yes. All natural. As is liver king. Right. Yeah. Um, but he rode that bull, and that bull came out and threw threw him up, and it threw his head back. And when Tough came down over the top of him, he smashed the side of his face and put nine plates in the side of his face. So, the injuries Damn. that these guys sustain to be excellent, to be elite at what they do, to them, it's worth it. And I, I get it. That's why it's important to understand that how well are you actually taking care of yourself, though, when you're doing these very arduous tasks? Are you eating right? Are you in a good good relationship? Do you have yeah. an ability to manage and, and, and understand your stress? Where in which you put your focus and standards to can support your, your desire to do wild, wicked things? And I, I think people forget that part. A lot of business leaders I've, I've seen over the years and worked with, public figures, they've built their empires on the back of the focus on money and the focus on fame, focus on growth and overriding all the other areas of their life and yeah, wondering to why the they're detriment s- of everything. Else. Absolutely. And they're wondering why they're just suffering and miserable in silence every single day. It's like, dude, you, you didn't support yourself to be optimal holistically to get to the top of the game. So you're at the top, you have these bank accounts, but now what? Yeah. Like you said, these roadie cowboys, okay, you're broken. Great. You, you got a world title. Fantastic. I respect that, but you are miserable. You have four divorces and your body's broken. What's it worth? So I think it's important to go back to preparation and making sure you have all areas of your life in a place of preparation for your tasks and for your goals. And I think that's why people um, are are changing their approach to how they do things in life now. I would agree. Yeah. How did your uh, military career change post nine eleven? So, I mean, everybody's had a. Uh, I think everybody kind of woke up and was like, "Oh, 
<laughs> so we're yeah, gonna do yeah. this for real now. Yeah, <laughs> for real. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, Kosovo 2000 came home and reenlisted. Um, trained, doing all the. I've told you, trying to get to Ranger School. September 11th happened. We were in Afghanistan in December of 01. So um, we were there until June of 2002. And Where'd they drop you guys? We started in Pakistan. We were down in this like fire co- base compound down in Pakistan where we kind of like chalked out of to do our different operations. And they would air assault us into different areas of Afghanistan. Bagram Air Base is one place that we ended up at, uh, Kandahar Airfield. Um, we did, you know, Operation Anaconda. So yeah. we have... Um, we did it. My very first combat operation in Afghanistan was called Mountain Line. It was this uh, intel gathering. So we had an attachment of um, um, ODA guys and a couple, um, I think they were SEALs with us, but I'm trying to remember exactly the whole task force that they put together. But I remember we were basically seeking out intel and blowing up cave complexes. So my, they were using us as mortars to destroy these cave systems that they have in there and sometimes we were blowing shit up in there and people were in that you know it's just part of the part of the process but that was my first experience with light almost like a light hot uh hot lz so when we got air assaulted into the chinooks uh we had a couple rounds hitting the aircraft you know as we're trying to get off of it things like that it wasn't really crazy or heavy i don't want to mm-hmm. seem like it was some wild wild west thing going on there but um, and then we would anaconda happened, and then some we did some other like task force joint stuff all around different parts of Afghanistan to support uh, operators and things like that um, yeah. with mortar rounds and and and, and airstrikes. But um, yeah, oh one oh two got home. Uh, that's when the army decided uh, the Black Beret didn't belong to the Ranger anymore, and they were going to give it to us. Shinseki, I think, was the guy that decided. Oh. Let's make that happen. So we had that whole ceremony. We got home from Afghanistan, and then of course Iraq kicked off. So we went back to Iraq shortly thereafter. <laughs> So up until that point, yeah. only Rangers wore Black Berets? Yeah. I guess I, I, I certainly... My I never, brother had one. I never paid attention to it because we never use Berets. Right. Now <clears throat> I associate Rangers with a tan beret. That's what they have now, yeah. Okay. My brother was pissed. I mean, they, they when they went to That's Rip, what I had heard from yeah. people. Like the, you know, first off, if we're talking about the manliest of headwear... A beret is not at the top of the list. <laughs> Fucking Viking helmet with two little holes it, that, <laughs> and like horns and shit coming yeah. off. Like that's, or old medieval yeah. you know, war helmets. Like that, a yeah. tassel of hair, not yeah. yours, somebody no. <laughs> else's that you took from them unwillingly. Like, Part of the skull and the yeah, yeah. Yeah, scalp. Just underneath that is a fucking painter's headwear, yeah. which let's be honest, that's what a beret is. Sorry, army guys. Love you all. Beret. I mean, put a tassel on it or something. Like, let's church it up here a little bit. But- yeah, I remember my buddies, again, I never really tracked it, but I have heard so many conversations about the importance of the colors, which I totally get. And I guess for whatever reason, I just associated tan, which I think is the modern era. Yeah, it was uh, the, Ar- the Army's birthday in 2002 when they did the change of you know, PC hats, the patrol caps to the beret for the Army, which a lot of us infantry guys were really irritated at that. We're like, we like our PCs. We can fold them up, throw in our pocket. It's yeah. so weird that we have to form fit this thing to our head. And we're like, oh, come on. Another thing you guys well, want to give us? It looks super dope. Uh, it doesn't look weird at all. Uh, <laughs> you know. But so that happened. And then, of course, we were tra- we just kept training. Uh, and we kept getting the word that, you know, Iraq was next on the table. And um, we deployed to Iraq. And then I just... I fought, Andy, I fought whether or not I should stay in or get out. Um, I was a little... Pre or post that deployment? Uh, during Iraq. Oh, interesting. Oh, 03, we were there during the push. Okay. Which really cool is because I was a corporal, got laterally promoted from specialist to corporal because I was in charge of the 60s section that I was on. And um, they were like, hey, we got it. We want. We need to promote you. We need to put your packet in and go to the board, but we're, we're going to war again. So we, we have to postpone. Maybe we can revisit that in, in country. I was like, whatever. doesn't matter to me. Um, we get overseas and we we do the push and we before we deployed they um excuse me the aviation units came up to the infantry brigades and said hey we um since we're deploying iraq we only have crew chiefs that can s- secure the right side of the aircrafts would you guys be willing to give up some of your infantry guys for the push uh to ride as door gunners on the left side of the of the black Hawks? why do they only do the right side that doesn't make i don't sense. I, I don't understand either i'm not aviation i really i don't know. They're I not really anti turners, huh? They can't go left and right. It's no. It, they, I mean, back in those, it was 2003, so or 2002 to 2003. They had the 60s, and and they, I don't know. They just hmm. said, hey, we need extra bodies. And my uh, section sergeant and I were were close because we had like seven days that separated our time in service. He's like, hey, I'm going to hook you up, and I'm like, he's like, get the hell out of here for a little bit. Why don't you go play with the aviation guys and go fly as a door gunner? So I was like, all right, I'll go check that out. Um, some of my um, 
my gunfights happen from an aircraft, like uh, shooting at people from an aircraft with a 60, which is kind of fun. Um, but I got to go fly during the push to Baghdad for the first two months with an aviation unit. I, I even earned my air crew member wings, which was strange even for the aviation guys. Hmm. Uh, I did 105 hours of combat flight time over there. But um, when I was over there, I got back to my infantry unit because I'd missed it. I was like, I want to get back into more of this kind of fight. Um, my first sergeant and my company commander and my platoon sergeant was like, hey, they sat me down at like 2 o'clock in the morning. I had been monitoring my guys at the gate. We had General Petraeus coming up to our compound up northern Iraq. Um, and I think we were north of Talifar. And uh, they said, hey, we want to talk to you about reenlistment. And they sat me down in the CP and they said, hey, do you want to stay in the military? And I thought, I was like, I've been battling this. Um, what, can I speak candidly? I go for it. And I said, uh, I've been fucked out of airborne school twice. Um, I, I got pushed away from going to pre-ranger. I want my ranger tab. I want to learn leadership skills about myself. I want to better myself. And the army keeps telling me, go fuck myself. And it keeps telling me um, I'm not good enough to be a better leader. And for me, that's it doesn't feel good. Um, they're like, well, how about this? We'll give you your E5. It's like, I think I've already earned my E5, but okay, we'll send you to Ranger School. We'll give you Airborne School, but you got to give us at least six more years. And I thought, <sighs> that's a big check. That was a huge check. So how are you feeling about your service at that time? Were you enjoying what you were doing? Were you fulfilled by it? I, I did enjoy it. I loved being a mortarman. I, I won't bash that at all. Uh, you know, everybody goes, well, were you special forces? That's, I Who mean, even shit? my Lyft driver over here asked me if I was special force. And I said, what, do you know there's more to the military than that? And it's not, a, just look at him and go, Hey, dick face. <laughs> it's, I can have a beard and not be an SF dude. Right. Cause that's like everybody. Like, so what was your beard? Like, They're like, well, if you were like me, it was shitty. Cause I look like I'm an Amish person. Like if you need me to go undercover churning butter, I'm your fucking guy. You're not right? like Shrek McPhee, right? Yeah. No. Do you want me to fucking whittle you a chair yeah. at a fucking Oak somewhere? Like that's the only place I'm going to disappear undercover. But now, I mean, again, you, <laughs> people just hear that that's all they think now of the military and granted there's we're just at different echelons and different operational you know uh, capacities but i loved it i did love being in combat arms i did love wearing the 101st patch on my shoulder i thought it was part of a, a historic unit that had it had a story to it um i heard stories from my grandfather about the airborne troops the 101st i liked it they have a storied history for sure for sure I was with the Rockasans 187 Infantry Regiment, Third Brigade Combat Team. Um, they were they themselves they jumped into Korea. They were called Rockasans by the Japanese uh, or Umbrella That Falls, so yep. the parachutes. So it was nice to I be. I could buy that of, explanation actually. <laughs> if you didn't know what it was, but like I saw somebody suspended from an umbrella. Yeah, actually, that's what the Japanese called it. You could tell that to somebody who's never seen skydiving. It makes sense. And they'd be like, "Okay, yeah, I get it." <laughs> yeah, and, that's, and it stuck. It, yeah. it stuck with the unit. They used to wear steel berets. That was their thing back in the day. They called them the iron steel, Rockets, like steel colored. You know, we miss you, steel berets. Imagine trying to form real steel around your head and keeping that as a no. But that's exactly <laughs> why I could see the military force it, doing that. Oh, and by the way, yeah. there's only one size. Here it is for hundred guys. <laughs> that's how the military would figure do it. it out. Here's our new beret. <laughs> we realize you come in all shapes and sizes, yeah. and here is your size. As I do everything, problem solve that. Yeah, figure it out. Right. Um, but I liked it, and I, and I, but that's why I fought it because I thought I'm young still. I have all this energy. I, I, you know, I've, I've seen my, uh, my decent fair share of combat. I know that more is coming. I also knew that I had a feeling that this is something's not ending. We were talking about it. We're like, this is going to go a while. It feels like it. Um, but the at, the attitude of we'll give you the things you've been asking for. You should. I had airborne in my contract, guys. Yeah. I should have had that already. I just wanted to go to jump school for God's sake. Um, we're going to give that to you and we're going to promote you to the rank you should have been promoted at already, but you got to give another six years of your life. It's a really unbalanced opportunity. And I just said, they're like, Hey, take a couple of days to think about it. And I went, okay. And it just got to the point where I, I I'm done. I can't, I had 78 days of, of terminal leave saved up when I got out. So I was already thinking like, okay, I can get out, still get paid, go figure out what I'm going to do, build something for myself. That's what I was going to ask you. Had you put any thought into what the next would be as you were kicking those options around in your head? Yeah, uh, quite a bit. Um, there were nights where I didn't sleep, uh, not even though I was tired. Um, active thinking, mind. Active mind, yeah. thinking about it. Um, there are three days that uh, even my section sergeant, was, uh, 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 Harris was his name, he actually ordered me to go take a nap because I just wasn't going to bed. I was fighting those those internal demons in my head about what do I do where do I want to go what am I going to be creating for myself do I get out of the military take what I've learned through my life experiences and apply it somewhere else or do I stay knowing I might go I might have more combat rotations which okay that's fine um, I can probably get to Ranger Battalion because that's where I ultimately wanted to go so that fight it raged for a couple weeks and I just decided I, I can't I can't win with that. I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And I feel like I have a skill set that I, I discovered more of like, um, 
an in, a, a, a talent, if you will, as when I led my, my guys where I was able to um, get them through their stresses much more efficiently. I was able to address where certain problems they were dealing with while we're trying to operate and do the jobs we were doing were coming from. And they were like, man, I didn't know you. How did you know that about me? How were you able to see that with me? I didn't know you, you, you knew that about my, uh, who I was or whatever. I, so I figured, you know what? Clearly, I have a leadership talent here that I can apply to something else. Let me go build something for myself and let me get out into the world and see where I can apply that. And when I got out of the military, I just decided, screw it, I'm going to get out. So I, I did ETS, got my that coveted DD-214, yeah. uh, rode my Harley at the time. I was a Harley rider uh, from Fort Campbell down to Nashville and basically was on a sunny, beautiful. I mean, I rode it to formation in the morning, final formation. It was like... 20 degrees outside. I was riding up from Nashville and I didn't care. I was like enjoying the cold. I'm like, I'm get out of here. I'm going to go build something for myself. And then I just sought out more of that personal development side of things. How do I fight my demons from seeing the dead bodies to uh, the things we did overseas or in all the stresses I carry from my life uh, growing up uh, that I have not faced and dealt with? How is that going to hinder me being able to do something out in the world the right way? So I decided that, you know, that proverbial self mastery that everybody talks about was the key. So I kept finding myself in uncomfortable situations so that I can face what I'm capable of accomplishing when I'm dealing with that stress. And that is what allowed me to get to that place of real internal peace and freedom. And I built basically something around that to provide that to other people. The intuitiveness that you felt around uh, leadership when you were the corporal or how you described it, you know, helping people make decisions in that operational setting. Do you feel that that was something that you were innately born with or something, a skill that you were taught in the military or a combination of the two? I, the, the military accentuated it. I, I feel I discovered and learned years later and looking back, okay, I carried this essence about me. My whole family growing up, I was the black sheep. I was always the one that people would dump their stress on. Everybody erupted around me. It's it's amazing where I would sit there and have no idea why Uncle you know Joe would say what he just said to me as if I was his enemy. And it's like he was dealing with crap in his marriage. And yeah. when he's around Wiley, the 12 year old sitting on the couch at a Christmas party at the family's house, you know, you and your, you know, the, and he would just start unloading on me. I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong with this guy? So I didn't understand that. I felt like someone was wrong with me. I a lot started of moral to, burden and weight there. Right. And I thought, am I weird? Am I different? Um, kids at school would do that. Uh, teachers would do that. And I thought, well, hmm. dude, what's wrong with me? Uh, so I, I didn't get it. And again, being an athlete, being expected to perform constantly. I was trained by the California Angels pitching staff in the 80s, learning how to perfect my, my arm. Um, I was expected to do these things while dealing with all of that pressure outside of me. And it's a, no wonder I was like, go fuck yourself. I'm out of here. And I got into the world bull riding. I got into a world that was wild and different. And then the military, um, but the military truly accentuated my understanding of my capacity and what I'm capable of accomplishing and the gift that I was born into the world with, which is the combination of what I apply now into the work that I do on fucking leaders and getting them to face yeah. their demons and putting them in the most uncomfortable positions in real time with them, but holistically where I bring in specialist resources from across the field of human performance to work in tandem with us as we are truly making them face those truths, those stresses they are literally harboring inside them that are impacting their performance, their decision-making, their ability to grow their company the right way, experience the results that they say they want. And that's because they are constantly surrounded by yes men. They're constantly surrounded by people who do not want to get into the trenches with them and fight through those things with them. It's here's a program or a process, here's a system, here's a strategy, fix it, figure it out. And that leaves limitation that, that leaves gaps in someone's personal performance. So I feel that gap. Yeah. You know, I've come to the conclusion, uh, you know, being out of the military now for coming up on 10 years, but wow. I still spend a good amount of time, you know, just being on the, the triple seven expedition with guys like Mike Sorelli, who, yeah. uh, enlisted prior Marine Corps, like fucking honor man. Like, Oh, I think I'm going to go on. Oh, here's the honor man certificate. Like just a, <laughs> a, a, a high yeah. performer among high performers. Right. We talk a lot about leadership because I love asking that question, you know, because I get asked all the time, are leaders born or can they be built? And my answer is yes, because I, you're, of course, going to come out of the box with some level of capacity. And of course, you could find yourself in a, in a great mentorship environment where the things are taught, or maybe it's got a very structured approach to it, or probably the most important thing is the culture is set properly for you as you are ascending up. But in talking with Mike, and we both land at the same place, the easiest environment to be a leader in is the military. You got to think about it. Like to become a SEAL. That, yeah. So to become a SEAL. That makes sense. Yeah. Everybody's bought in. It's an environment <laughs> where not only is everybody bought in, 
but to even get there to play the game. To, so to be a SEAL, got to volunteer, join the military. Check. That's going to cut out a vast majority of right people there. who have yep. no interest. Yep. And then when I went through, it was like, hey, fourth week in boot camp, they put in this grainy VHS tape <laughs> with a dude in like an uh, SDV, which is a mini sub, never go anywhere near them, anybody ever, I guess, unless you're into that shit. Um, and like some people climbing out of the water and they're like peeking around. Uh, like, Who wants to go yeah. be a SEAL? I'm yeah. like, I do, because I wanted to be a SEAL since I was 11. But right. not many people agreed to do that. So there's another layer. Then you got to take the PT test, which is not... A test. It was like eight pull-ups, some push-ups, some sit-ups, swing gotcha, run. Gotcha, gotcha. But at, at every step along the way, it there's a little bit of pairing the larger group down. Then you get to butts, right? And then there's that huge crucible that it is. It's designed to be. Of course. But then at the end of that, you're still not a SEAL. You got to do about another 18 months of training. You're going to lose a couple guys. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Out of 30 guys who started, they called it S. Sealed, seal qualification. I forget which one it was for me. SQT. SQT. Yeah. yeah. You lose a couple, or they're probably going to get retreaded because there's that investment. Then you get to the SEAL team, and then you're a brand new guy. But the brand new guy on his first day working for, let's say, an 03, a lieutenant in the Navy, who's probably, you pick up, oh, so if you have a heartbeat and you're in the Navy, <laughs> this is not a bullshit thing. I, yeah, I know absolutely. this. Absolutely. That's why I laughed. I took advantage of the system. <laughs> Yeah. Two years to the second that you put on 01, you put on 02. Two years to the second that you put on 02, you put on 03. Mm, I see. And then yeah. 04 is going to be probably four to six years at an 03. But you have a lieutenant. Maybe they're a little bit junior. Maybe they have a little bit more book knowledge about leadership. They've come from uh, one of the service academies or ROTC where they talk conceptually about leadership, but they have less leadership capital per se. Right. But they're surrounded by people that have been refined and selected so many times that have complete and utter buy-in in the mission, regardless of the diversity of background. It's an alignment of individuals that I've never seen anywhere outside of the military. And people think, oh, you were a leader in the military? Come on over to my civilian world and you're just going to drop you right into the system and you're going to flawlessly <laughs> perform. And it's not the case. Military leadership, I'm sorry, and people can disagree with me if they want to, I think it's the easiest environment ever. Because of that buy-in, the military, the it was so I can only speak to the SEAL community because I, I interfaced very infrequently outside of the special operations right. world. So I, right. I don't know what it might be like in the conventional military, but the culture was set. There was a legacy and a lineage that everybody knew. And it was in me from day one. The first thing that you want to talk about setting culture, the number one thing that we hammer students on in BUDS is distance from your swim buddy. So it becomes a we versus me environment, right? And you right. break your you break individuals of the sense of me, and they become right. a look left and look. So you're setting culture Team. from day one. Teamwork. The person to your left and right is equally, if not more important than you are. If they do something great, you're going to get the praise. If you do something stupid, they're going to suffer. For, like, 100%. That shit doesn't happen in no. the civilian world. No. And I also no. don't recommend that the civilian world uses the tools that we use no. to teach those lessons. That's a very, I was about to <laughs> actually add that if you didn't, but yeah. Because you're yeah. going to get fucking sued. Yeah. You, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think half the shit that we did, yeah. is, even in the conventional military, is even remotely considered by legal. Yeah. yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah. at the pipeline, on the team, everybody is oriented within one degree of each other in the direction. So a leader... I mean, you are taking leaders with the most refined, high-performing teams that there are that are aligned. That doesn't exist, in my experience, in the civilian sector. It doesn't. And and you, you 100%, I can see that now, even looking back. You're right. Even in the conventional military, even with the kind of unit that I served in, when I served in the, the late 90s, that's when I joined, they still had it where if you were, if you fucked off, you're done. They they will find a way to get rid of you. And, the, and, and I'm telling you, the culture. That it's a culture. Navy boot camp. I'm, I'm going to make a broad statement here. It's tougher than Air Force boot camp. I have no data points to support that, but it's not as harm as, as the Army or Marine Corps. <laughs> there it's it's yeah. definitely not as hard, but it's not the easiest one. But even those transitions, it was eight weeks. I, and I truly look back, and I've made this comment many times on the podcast, like I learned how to fold my clothes in a really weird manner. True. That I still do. <laughs> do you? Do you still do it? You roll it up too? T-shirts. That's... No, I fold the T-shirts. Oh, you fold it. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I learned how to march. Oh, I see. And I, I learned drill. how to recognize rank from like a drill distance. ceremony stuff. Yeah. 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 And most of the rest of the stuff was based around shipboard military. Yeah. But even in boot camp, it was all about, hey, this is your division. Right. And inside of your division, here's the roles and responsibilities. It was this, it was the setting of the culture right from day one. 
So even in a convention, and again, I don't know what happened to the people that went uh, to the conventional military, but I have to believe that at least that initial transition from civilian world, do what you want, be who you want, pursue personal goals over team goals, it's it starts setting you in that direction where you can be really effective as a leader because of that buy-in. I agree. I agree. And it's interesting. I went through boot camp twice. I joined the Why? delayed entry program <laughs> in 97. Um because I wanted to get into the military. I wanted just to be in that environment, especially with the whole situation with sports, my father, et cetera. So they put me through and I went to it and I had this water purification specialist MOS in the reserves. I was, I was finishing high school. That sounds exciting. It's, you know why I did it though is because my drill unit would have been Camp Pendleton and I lived in Orange County and I was like, you know That's what? favorable. Perfect. Yeah. So I'll finish school and I'll do my drills. And I'll learn. And I was go. I would go down to my drills, and I would destroy everybody in PT. I'm an athlete. That's, that's what I played. I played baseball and football, and I would finish first, second all the time. And my, my first sergeant would sometimes beat me in the run. And they pulled me in the office, like you don't belong here anymore. What, when are you graduating? Because you need to go active duty. You need to be in the combat arms. You be, you belong there. Watch how you interact with people. This is for people that kind of want the more of this lifestyle. The, the you know one week once one week in a month yeah. kind of supportive lifestyle. And I was like, great, let's do it. And that's when I joined the, the active duty. Now, I didn't have to deal with the first three weeks of infantry combat uh, basic training again because I'd already gone through it. So they let me hang out with like the prior service guys. Hmm. Um, I was 11 x-ray and there was a guy in my barracks at the time who said, hey, I'm I'm the one who's responsible for the orders. What do you want to be? I was like, Charlie, I want to be a mortarman, door kickers right now. I want to go blow stuff up. So he gave me that MOS. I didn't have to wait for them to give it to me. And then I went through boot camp again and I loved going back through it again because I remember the structure I got from the first time and I applied it and I they put me a, maybe the uh, platoon guide on and then a squad leader as well. So I got the different positions and I sustained that throughout the next 14 weeks. And, and then went to my uh, mortar school, which is another three weeks after that. We had this interesting, we had this guy who was old school, had a CIB on his chest. He was in his late 40s, I think, a uh, Desert Storm vet who, who came back through and went rejoined the Army as well. So I remember hmm. seeing that because I had been debating going back in even in my, my later years. But I agree with you because when I went back through that, I realized, wow, the culture here in the infantry or combat arms, the, everybody here wants to be in this job. Yeah. That we wake up at four 30 in the morning and we go out and get PT to death. We, you know, do our combat tactics. We learn how to shoot, move and communicate. We learn how to work as a team problem solve together. N there was maybe one or two people in there that weren't, they didn't belong there and they got weeded out quickly. Vast but, minority though. What's that? The people that didn't really want to be there. They were the vast minority. Of right. Those vast minority. hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. And that's the thing is I would witness that. And, and it was nice to get rid of them because you could feel getting rid of that almost, yeah, we clink and everybody that wanted to be there was always motivated. And despite how tired you were or how hungry you might have been or what they were telling you or doing to put you through. And it was just the buy in of they're ripping us apart to make us better. So it, we never felt like we would wake up. And I remember it. I was squad leader. And I'm telling my guys in boot camp. Hey, look, there's nothing they're going to put us through that we can't accomplish and we can't get through. Just do it one day at a time. We're fine. Make your bed when you get up. Win at one task, then do the next. If you have questions and you need support, I'm right here. Let's do it together. And it was always about taking care of each other. And I thought I learned as a squad leader in the boot camp and then eventually in the military active duty was that it was my responsibility to make sure that they were taken care of first long before I got taken. I ate last. I learned you know, and realized that no matter what, those guys are going to be the people that are going to make our team function well. And I'm just here to make sure it stays together. Not it's, you're right. It's one of the hardest aspects mm. of leadership because it is a burden, but not in the way I think that people maybe hear and receive that. The burden, at least in the way I would describe it, is it's exhausting and burdensome because you're spending so much time worrying about other people that you have no time to really be concerned with yourself. Right. You have. <clears throat> I, I, uh, for most of my career, I was like middle management, which actually was glorious, like an E five team guy at development group with a rifle and like a sledgehammer or a yeah. shotgun. And they would be like, let me wind you up. And like, over or are here, you in a target or, and like, and if that doesn't work, maybe <coughs> over here, right. Amazing job. And then the last deployment I did, I was, uh, was it Oh three, or at least I was wearing Oh three as my rank from time to time. And I, it was the most exhausting deployment I had ever done because I was so worried I was going to do something stupid that would get somebody injured or cost them their life or make a bad decision. And I was second guessing myself. 
I, I second guessing myself for the purpose of trying to make sure I didn't fuck somebody else over. That was the burden. It's not like, yeah, you oh, weren't you know, selfish. No, it's like, oh, it's so heavy being a leader. It's like it should be heavy because you care so much about the people that yeah. are working for well, you. Well, considering what is the weight you're carrying that feels heavy, is yeah. that coming from a selfish place or is it coming from no, a, a fear of fucking, doing something that, right? Yeah, that kills that guy next to you. Yeah, and that it is a heavy burden. But when you accept that responsibility, that changes everything. You have to shift your. Um, perspectives. You have to change your attitude and your mindset. You have to stop living and operating from a place of how do I accomplish what it is I need to accomplish for myself first and realize that when, even back in garrison, I got to get up, I got to plan an RPT for the day. I got to make yeah. sure these guys have their training in, in order. I, I got to promote this guy. We've got there. That is heavy, but it's worth it because you learn so much about yourself and you, you get to experience the impact that it has on other people's lives that then inspires them to step up themselves and become a leader when it's their time. Hard to describe how rewarding that feels. Very hard. It, it's uh, it's yeah. moving. Like it's almost emotionally moving when you see people benefiting in, in in ways that they may not even recognize. Right. Because you did your job. Like it's it's awesome. And that's I think the biggest battle that I had getting out of the military and going out and doing. Now again, it's what drives me. The fundamental flaw that drives what I do even now is taking all of those lessons as a leader and seeing the gaps in how people approach personal development and their own growth. Um, out in the civilian world, we want the shortcuts. Yeah. Um, the problem solving is if it if I can control it, then I'll do it. Sometimes the things that you need to do are the things you can't control to problem solve. And leaders in businesses, industries, uh, public figures, we see it time and time again. They hate that yeah. they have got they've grown so much of the ego and their own um, look at what I've created based on who I am it's easy to sweep away their employees or their staff and kind of chalk them up to just being you know expendable peasants and that's the difference between the military and the civilian world which is why it for me I I my relentless commit uh, commitment to this mission I'm on is to unfuck these people that want it I only work with three people a year. It's very intimate. I live with my clients. I travel with my clients. I'm in their life, integrated with them, putting them through challenges on a daily basis as shit is hitting the fan with them and they can't control it. And they erupt and they, they stretch and they see parts of themselves they never actually addressed. And they go, what is going on? And it's the demons they carry that make them act selfish and make them behave the way that they do. So they, they want the military guy that writes the book. They want the guy so they can read and say, I, I followed the SEALs steps to be a better CEO. But it's like, yeah, but you're still a, a dick at the end of the day. Your wife hates you, your health. And so look at the environment do. that you're trying to lead in. Right. Like what's the, what's the culture? The culture. Is, it is yep. so incredibly important. Absolutely. But where's the culture built from? It's the quality and the character of the leader yeah. that determines that. And it, and you have to permeate it at all levels. Absolutely. You can't have this glass ceiling where all of a sudden there's a cultural shift. Right. Especially when people can see that. They're like, oh, fuck you. <laughs> so yeah. what, what would you describe? How would you describe what you do now professionally? Like somebody said to you, like, hey, what do you do? For oh, me? geez. Um, I think I've had a thousand different ways I've answered that question over the last 14 years that I've been doing it. I figured um, you would. It's, it's so uniquely... That's why I use that that term unfucking their lives. And um, what that means is I, I'm, what did my client say? I had a public figure client of mine who I met through a PR friend of, uh, years ago. And he said, your work is undescribable, but the best way I can apply this is because I, I know SEALs is like, it's the proverbial Navy SEAL training equivalent to leadership development, high performance without getting cold, wet and sandy. And I was like, okay, so everything that we put on our website is not just marketing hype shit. It is legitimately words that clients have used over the years, mm -hmm. um, eruptions of uh, unfucking. I'm like, okay, they're using it. I'm just, I don't know how to explain it, but they call me their performance accelerator. Uh, and I, okay. I laugh and go, you know, I can be, I'm a glorified trash, trash man. I come in and I clean up your shit and I optimize your life and I make you face truth and I, and I battle those demons with you in real time so that we can eradicate the stresses that plague you and impact your focus, your discipline, your decision making, your problem solving. That's, is, that's the stuff that leaks out into the people and the culture that they have around them. That is what impacts, impacts people's ability to thrive in their lives. Look what's going on in across our, our political landscape right now. I mean, I know you know this well, but leaders are on social media basically bickering like school children, fighting each other, uh, uh, 
bullying each other. I watched one of your episodes with that um, Frazier, I think her name was, the doc- doctor of brain health. Yes. Um, and she talked about a point I wanted to make even talking to you was they're out there doing this to each other and then turn around and telling people, but don't do it like that or you're going to be punished for it. And it, that's, To be honest with you, I have a hard time even describing them at leaders. As that, leaders at this I point. use that term loosely. Well, most yeah, people absolutely. do, and I think they would use it internally. I'll right. give them elected official. Okay. But to me, leadership is its about more than what you say. Not a title. Well, it, yeah, it's, it's based in your actions. Absolutely. And one of the, <clears throat> the fastest ways that I have myself lost faith in people is when I see a divergence between actions and words. You should do this. And then you see that like, you're doing the opposite. Like right. you're saying, right. like, don't do it like this, guys, as they're doing it. It's like, I can't listen to what you're saying anymore well because that's yeah and there's that, this crazy divergence absolutely. between the message and your actions absolutely well that's the thing there's no and the, the integrity is missing they yeah. don't they're not there's no integrity with them but going back to that is it's my my mission and why i do what i do is to bridge the gap of how people are being supported that are at the top i don't work with the masses i am impact and influence the leader the leaders use yeah. that term in air quotes for those that are just listening to the audio um the public figures, you see them across social media as well. There's so much dysfunction happening right now because of their own personal quandaries. They they are not dealing with their own personal shit. And then they're standing out on stages and saying, follow me, my mm-hmm. advice. Look what I could do. Do the same thing. And it's like, that's unacceptable. And I've worked in industries and personal development in the circles of Tony Robbins and all those guys. And I've seen it firsthand. I'm, they're building programs based on people's desires to feel good when it comes to personal growth that doesn't challenge them the way they need to be challenged. And I, you know what I read about your bio and it's like, you know, you're always constantly seeking things that scare you. And I love that because when I put my clients through, I, I, I'm willing to do myself every single day. It sucks sometimes certain things. I got to maintain my life a certain way. Getting up in the morning, I, I have to get up tomorrow at three o'clock in the morning. My flight leaves at five 30. Okay. I hate getting up that early. I had to get up early to come out here. Sometimes I got to do that to travel across the country. That's okay. I'd get up at two. If I were you, I'd yeah. be at the airport by two 30. Kalispell airport is super busy. Is it really? Absolutely. Says no, it totally over the, fucking okay. with you. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, wait a second. You know this very well. There's um, seven people was, in the airport there. Fuck, man, it's four o'clock in the mornings when that terminal <laughs> opens. Um, but anyway, going back to that point, leaders use loosely because actions matter more than title or status. And I, for me, it's if the world's going to change, we have to get those at the top that have the biggest influence and impact to operate in integrity with who they are personally and professionally because they're personal. And this is the thing I say time and time again, and everybody that listens to it, I've been challenged with this and I don't care, is your personal and professional performance are not mutually exclusive. How well you live your life directly impacts how well you perform in your profession. If you are not willing to embrace the suck of the shit you have not faced or battled it's going to leak into your performance it's going to affect who you are and that's why your culture suffers that's why you're on that proverbial roller coaster of make money lose money uh stress constantly is you know is present and permeates every facet of your company especially when it starts to grow and become big and it's important to get the leaders as they grow to to be the ones that set the standard for how people operate so how did you Bridge the gap between the experience you left the military with and and grow it into what mm. you are doing now, because that's I don't want people to think that you can. Not that this is impossible, but I think you and I could speak speak pretty openly. Just because you go into the military and come out of it after, say, six to ten years, combat yeah. arms, non combat arms, special operations, non special operations, <clears throat> doesn't necessarily tool you to go and take those lessons and teach them to others. That's a good point. You know, you, you might have been the recipient of some great experiences, but not everybody picks them up to the same level, you know? Agreed. Um, <clears throat> so how'd you bridge the gap? How'd you figure out to take what you had learned and package it in a way that you could actually impact others? I think war did that. I think being a leader in combat um, stuck with me. Um, I, I got my first taste of real leadership, like real leadership, in Iraq with a 60 mortar team and being responsible for those guys with our gun systems and the operations we would go on. And of course, some of the, uh, the minor gun fights that we would find ourselves in or whatever, I realized that it just, it's almost like it ignited something inside me that just stayed. And I, when I got out of the military, I, I've missed the military since I not even remotely bullshitting. I have, was on the internet six weeks ago 
looking up, hey, how how old do you uh, have to be to, to re-enlist in the military? What's the oldest you can be? You miss and the not, highlights. I, you don't miss the conversations that it, go, that's what I was like, say. hey, what do I, I need yeah, to go to ranger yeah. school? To, well, they say, well, you just need to sign this contract for eight, eight years. years. Yeah. What I miss of it is not necessarily the military aspect. It's the brotherhood, the teamwork, um, Probably the, capa- the, culture. the culture, the capacity for growth in your own leadership, understanding that you're a leader in your life first. Everybody's committed to, to a common task, goal, outcome, and people do in general. We, there were guys in my, my unit that we didn't like each other, but you're damn right we would watch each other's back and take bullets for each other. Yeah. There was... We, I mean, downright almost got into fistfights in, in the barracks back in the day, but we didn't care. When it came time to, to do our job, that that stuff went out the window. Well, I those are that. In, Those are internal issues that are uh, invisible to the exterior world. Right. So going back to your question is, I, it just stuck with me, and I realized that the world outside of the military is – is is not functional the way it should be. It could be human beings in general. We we are the the common denominator to everything in the military, out of the military. How do I give these people that have never experienced this the same or similar type of environment to better themselves, so that they can live an optimal life and they can experience that kind of satisfaction where they care about those around them and they put others around them first, so they can experience growth sustainably and have that peace and satisfaction while they're making a bunch of money. To me, that's what motivated me to take what I learn and what I know about myself and build something around that. I started working with combat veterans. I was gonna say, how'd you put structure to that? That structure was combat vets. Being a combat vet, that was the first place I I met a guy, um, I was going to college, and uh, I wanted to be a firefighter. I thought, you know what, that'll be a good place, teamwork, brotherhood, I'm gonna go do that. And um, when I got to school, they had nothing for veterans. And I thought, well, this is weird. So how do we get our benefits? How do we get GI Bill? How do we go, you know, make sure that we're squared away if we have problems? And I started basically running my, my suck uh, to the, the staff at the school. And uh, the dean's like, hey, we have a task force we built. Would you be willing to come participate? Tell us what you need. What, you know, and we, so we opened up a Veterans Resource Center. And I remember going and speaking in San Jose um, at, a, at a conference for other schools in California that the need to open up veterans resource centers in your community colleges is important because you got a lot of veterans coming home now that are gonna need to know where their uh, mental health support is, their the GI bills, et cetera. So I did that and I got back and we, I was thinking about what, how am I gonna build this thing? And I'm in the Veterans Resource Center and I'm working with the Met- Orange County Mental Health Association as a liaison for them and combat vets coming back. And this veteran walks in and goes, hey, I've been watching you for a little while. He goes, um, how you carry yourself, how you talk to people, your, just your presence. I, can you teach me how to be like that? Because I'm dealing with a lot of chaos and I don't know how to get to that place where I feel good in my life. And he just said that to me. I thought, okay. And I started coaching him and I realized veterans need a support they can trust. So I just opened up myself to the space of going to events and conferences and where veterans were, um, different nonprofits and connecting with combat vets. I was working with Marine recon guys. I was working with army guys, uh, SWIC guys that I had met, um, and just supporting them through dealing with PTSD, healing through PTSD, getting off their medications, uh, sleeping better at night, having better relationships, coaching them through and experiencing the eruptions of those stresses they carry around to the point where the VA in San Diego, they're right off of that La Jolla village, the main mm-hmm. VA. Um, when I was going in there, some of the people I met that worked in that environment say, hey, unofficially, we kind of heard you know, what you're doing for vets. So some of the guys are coming in here talking about you. you know, could we like tell them about you, other veterans that are looking for things that are not medicated talk therapy kind of shit. Sure. That's absolutely. wild for somebody at the VA to say that. There were there were veterans and they were people that, you know, worked in the departments that yeah. I was just made friends with. So I know it was wild. I thought it is kind of strange, but they did it's unofficially. It's just generally not the common approach in my experience. Right. It's like, not. Hey, here's a prescription and go see this guy. Well, they did we're that. Down. Yeah, exactly. And they did that. And um and at the same time they were doing research and spent 4 million dollars from the government on transcendental meditation for PTSD. So it's simultaneously that was going on and they'd asked me to come participate in that. So I learned that aspect of meditation. I watched how it affected um, these veterans and I applied those principles as well into the work I was already doing and the veterans were just getting their life back and it eventually got to the point where some of the uh, vets that I worked with have friends that were doctors, lawyers. They're hey, they want to know if they can sit down with you. They see my life changing. They're willing if they you have a conversation with them, would you? And I, I started to be word of mouth passed to different people. And I had a, a recon guy who was an intel, eventually went to intelligence, worked with JSOC, and he said, um, my buddy's a pro baseball player, and he wants to know if you'll you'll come up and, and meet up with him and maybe work with him. And it eventually got to the point where I was started being passed to industries from those 
word of mouth referrals that way. And it would just stay that way for 12 years behind the scenes. I didn't build a website. I didn't have a business card. I was just meeting people, having relationships like this. Connecting. That's the most powerful way yeah. to navigate through those worlds. I didn't sell them on anything. There was no marketing. I didn't even go, hey, you want to be better? I was in the military. I can lead you. It was just, you feel me. You feel who I am when I'm with you. You understand that I, I'm not in it for myself. I'm here. Again, there's that energy you carry for you. And they would feel that. And they're like, I want a confidant, a brother like that to support me, to help me get through this shit that I'm going through. Uh, let's do work together. So every relationship I've ever had that I've worked with from public figures to CEOs all came from not compartmentalizing and like logically trying to figure out what they're going to get and how they're going to get it with me. It's from the relationship I built with them, the mm -hmm. calibration of connecting, breaking bread, traveling together until it feels right that we decide to work together. That's how I do my business. And that's how I do it from an altruistic inside out approach, not this you know, bottom line, scale my business, how much money can I make? And that's why I've been able to be successful in it is because I'm approaching it from that brotherhood, that relationship, connecting to people from a, a deeper place rather than it being something that's packaged and sold to them as the next best thing that makes them elite, makes them great. Uh, I have a business partner in uh, the coffee shop and he he's, has said something recently a few times and it is, it is a point that I think it was powerful for me, and I think it's powerful for other people. But it, it's talking about scaling. Not every idea is meant to scale infinitely. You, it would be really hard. But it, you must think in the in the world that we live with, it's all about economy of scale. I have a great idea. Now I need to figure out a way to get this idea to as many people as possible yeah. and sell it to them yeah. for a tolerable price, so I can look at a fucking number in a bank account and engage my happiness off of that. Right. It sounds like what you're doing is super impactful, but you would have a really hard time scaling that beyond that interpersonal relationship because if your experience has been anything like mine, as you ascend into the tier of success, which a lot of people would put wealth into that, and a lot of times I find them they collide at some sure. point, the defensive radar is up on those people, and it should be because at some level, and especially when you start getting a net worth that starts with like a B. Oh, yeah. I've been around them. I don't know how those people – live in a world where almost everybody it seems like almost everybody around them in their ecosystem is either there for a reason for themselves they have a handout maybe they have yep. a hand in your pocket they might have a, hand, a knife in that hand getting ready to jab you hiding it well, so, I'm yeah. saying, so it's they become very defensive probably rightly due to their own experience but scaling what you're talking about it may not be possible so you can have an incredibly powerful impactful valid idea <laughs> but not every idea scales infinitely. I agree. And that's the problem. It's an, an incessant mental space of grow, 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 grow yeah. at all cost. I, I was on You a, could, but it would dilute. I can't scale what I do. Yeah. At all. Because well, you could hire people underneath you, but then it would dilute the product that you that's were providing the point. to those people. And my clients do make, you know, large investments to have me in their life, but the the money aspect is part of the transformation that happens in their life because it it's part of what scares them because I require so much of all of them to show up. Um, but the rewards of it is getting their life back and being able to be at the top of their game consistently without all the old stress that has plagued them. Scaling, I was on a phone with the CEO of a, a big marketing company recently who wanted to say, hey, let, we got to scale you. Let's do 10% of your investment amount and do eight people in a retreat. I'm like, I can't do retreats, man. I don't. That's just his business model that he's used to. And that's okay. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying like, but, if you come up in that ecosystem yes. and you're used to that, you, like you talk to people in the product world. Okay, we've got to get you in retail. Right. It's like, this isn't a fuck, like, My, no. And, and again, I'm not, and I'm not a coach and I don't do coaching tactics or strategies. I don't come from, okay, question asking. You know, I, I went to um, a, sem a seminar years ago with coaches and they were talking about, oh, you got to be a good coach. You have to ask the right questions and all your job is, is to ask ask the right questions to so that the client can figure it out for themselves. And I understand and appreciate that kind of model when it comes to certain aspects of life. But if you really want someone to be optimal in their life personally, internally, it goes far beyond that approach. And for me, you can't scale that. You can't scale yeah. my ability to be this private confidant that commits my life to my clients. I'm not when I mean travel and live, I mean travel and live. When I'm 24-7, my cell phone is now their direct access. And if they need to text me at 3 in the morning, I'm up. And What's get, your minimum time commitment to work with somebody? Yeah, we, I say three months, but it usually lasts anywhere from 6 to 12, to no more than 12. Okay. And that's and most people, the attrition rate, if you will, um, hit about 7, 8 months, and then they're done. And when I get – because I push them so far beyond what they thought their limits really were um, – 
I make them see and face things they never really thought they would ever face again. Um, and it, I'm, it's unpack that a little bit. Give me, um, and so I mean, yeah, to make I will it easier absolutely for, to make it easier for you though, like combine people and speak broadly, so nobody's going to be, you know what I mean, like in broad in the broadest of terms, for, as far as people are concerned, or issues like when you say you're having people, you know, mm. I'm just trying to figure out a way to let you speak broadly, so. Nobody would have be able to. I'm assuming you're the people that you work with. You'd rather very keep private, conf, yeah, private and confidential. But they trust me because of that confidentiality. Exactly. I'm yeah. trying to give you a, a runway that you can navigate. It's kind of like a yeah. secret, yeah, a clearance, if you will, that they do trust me. And yeah. I had, a, like you said, to be. I had a call with a billionaire not too long ago. Who same thing. His defenses were up, and that's only he said. I'm just that's a natural default to me. I've never had anybody who actually get gave, give a shit just to have a conversation with me without trying to ask me for something. Yeah. And it's like. I, it, it, but solve my problems this way. Well, your problems come from here. Ooh, and then they get really scared with the idea that they have to do work on themselves to fix the problems outside of them. But when they get to that that level, that's that's harder for for us to break through. But going back to your question, um, life's experiences that people go through, traumas, abuse, addictions, they leave a lasting impression energetically, emotionally, mentally. What ends up happening is most people seek methods of relief and coping rather than resolution. Talk therapy is great, but it brings awareness to a situation or problem. It doesn't heal it. Books are great because it teaches you new philosophies and insights, but it doesn't transform you. So I take that approach to all high achievers because it does not matter their industry, whether they're on Wall Street, professional sports, Hollywood, doesn't matter. They are all high achievers. They are all chasing something for themselves and most of them have built their lives their empires on the back of focusing on making money and scaling and becoming known and they have let go of everything else in their life they have stuffed down as we say outside the military sucked it up far too much and they have not faced those wars that rage within them so every person i've ever worked with it's not one specific thing they all have in common it's their own personal demons that they have not dealt with that are festering inside them from being poor kids growing up with abuse to turning into eight figure earner who doesn't know why he can't profit. Well, let's go back to the, the trauma you sustained and why that, that experience of abuse through trauma and being poor at the same time has affected you and infected you through your entire life. You've built everything around it, but you've never battled it you've never gone after the enemy and and fought it and killed it so you've bought into the idea that coaches and systems and processes outside of you will solve that problem but you never get out of that hole why because nobody's ever gotten into your shit with you into your life with you and seen where those nuanced differences are and has has done anything to remotely put you in a position that it rattles it from within and erupts it to the surface so you can see where it actually is coming from and you can finally address it head-on and eliminate it that happens in an interpersonal relationship. That is not something you can teach outside of. It's not a 60 minute keynote. Not at all. You know. So broadly speaking, high achievers for the most part are, and I've discovered, are, are running from something. That's why they're able to accomplish so much over here while everything is falling apart here. The alignment that they have to that level of success from a monetary standpoint is, is unbelievable. It's amazing that a guy can become a billionaire, but he's a complete utter screw up in his life. Uh, his relationships suffer. Some of the most unhappy people I've ever seen have a net worth. Yeah, like nine it, figures, eight. You know, eight, at nine, some ten. point, yep. to me, I, I I will like put onto my phone. I'm like one zero 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 <laughs> zero zero zero, and you just keep hitting zero. I'm like yeah. this is ridiculous. This is monopoly money, and you would think especially if you only viewed the world through the lens of Instagram and people posting highlights, right? this person can do what they want right. at any time, <clears throat> have anything, looks like they can have anybody, they must be the happiest person on the face of the planet. No. And you know what's interesting? I, had, uh, I was on a podcast a couple of years ago, and he said, oh, I get what you're talking about when it comes to peak performance. I said, enlighten me. He says, if we focus on making sure our financial situation is, is healthy first... <laughs> I knew you were going to laugh. You're like, nailed it, sir. Ah, you're Tell so good. More. And I said, please keep going. And, Chapter one. And he the said- The first thing that matters <laughs> is money. <laughs> money. He said, then you can turn around and basically buy the other areas of your life back into the, into the same level. You can peak performance money, and then you can turn around, you can do the same over here. And I've I tried thought, that you shit in my life. you fucking kidding me, man. I've tried filling holes in my life. Like, I need a thing. 
Yeah. And you feel awesome for, well, depending on the thing or the size, the investment, you feel awesome for a commensurate amount of time to the check that you write. Yeah. But it's not infinite. And then eventually the new thing wears off. Yeah. And you're staring into an abyss again. Same thing. Whatever it may be, a, it's just, a hole or a Grand Canyon, but- It's yeah, the same thing. We've I've tried it. It doesn't work. Yeah, exactly. It, it, that, that's the, the industry is cope. You hear it all the time. You just learn how to cope with your stress. Learn how to manage and just deal with it. And then we have these unbelievable industries, the alcohol industry, right? Pornography. We have uh, dis- everything that distracts us from the truth that we possess and who we are. And we feel like, well, we're human. And I hear that time and time. That's another one. Uh, well, I'm only human. Okay, what kind of bullshit excuse is that for you to not face? It's a pretty good one. Yeah, it's, it's a, a very good, one. good yeah. circular it's very argument. Good, but it's still bullshit. <laughs> yeah. At the end of, the day, it gets, of course we're all human. Yeah. Captain Obvious, we're all human. But that doesn't mean you have to be a subpar human yeah. for yourself. And success should be subjected to you. I want to disrupt this metric of what success is defined by and get it to the place where people are respecting and emulating how well someone is living their life and the impact they have on those around them in a positive manner rather than the popularity Good luck with that. I know that, but that's why. <laughs> well, that's why I care about my work and doing this with at least the the, the types of, of powerful people that want it, because at some at some degree, it's going to create some form of effect where they are, and that's to me, I've done my job. Yeah. Um, that's all I care about. Yeah. In the high performers that you have worked with, do you see any uh, pretty consistent themes or narrative across like a broad spectrum that they're dealing with? Yeah, they uh, they're constantly trying to scale. <laughs> they're trying to they're constantly trying to grow and create and um, reinvent. That's a big. I one. guess internally, as in, I mean, uh, uh, I'm going to say you're probably, especially now with the uh, level of clientele you're working with, you're probably working with some industry leaders, top performers, af- yeah. athletic or business world. Pull back the curtain of you know, take away the business side and the personal side. Do you see any themes, whether it's across athlete and business spectrums, where they all seem to, if you look at it, they're dealing with the same issues personally, not professionally facing, but just personally struggling with. Yeah, it's um, they have swallowed the life experiences that were negative and detrimental to them, the from upbringing, uh, family dynamics to health scares. It's it's the personal stuff that I've uncovered that is impacting these people is they have never had anybody that contains them properly or let alone understands the way their minds work, uh, the way they are built and how they're driven. Um, and they are allowed to just run freely with that to the point where- As long as they have results. Absolutely. Have you noticed, is there like one uh, category of, I don't like to use the word issue, but I don't know of a better word right now, that is the most detrimental to performance? Whether mm, that wow, be- Wow, that's a good question. Like, is it- um, a broken family? Is it a family that has a history of substance abuse? Is there one thing that you've been a, been able to identify that is more impactful than others? Hmm. I'm letting that populate right now. <laughs> it's the wheels tra- are turning. A lot of people say, well, trauma is <clears throat> just trauma. And it's like, no, nah, uh, not, not necessarily. Sure no, no. Because some trauma hurts and some trauma weighs you down for the rest of your life. Right. And there, you're, that's a good, that there, I, I'm glad you elaborated on that. Um, it's not all equally created, and you're right. Some last a lifetime. However, what I've found is it's usually from dysfunctional family dynamics of generational stress that has not been dealt with. People will override because it's easy for us. Our psyches are designed by nature to protect us from things that are uncomfortable or scary, and we have not evolved as fast as our technology has. So when you're being pushed, uh, in a life experience or in general, um, what does the mind do? It says, well, resist this, push back on it. And then when it, when you carry that with you through your life, you don't like the way it feels. So what you end up doing is you override and you suppress and you find ways and tools like people are even using meditation and yoga as a coping tool. Now they're abusing that they're, it's almost like become addicted to that. Um, people it, doing the same thing with psychedelic treatments, psychedelic as well. treatments as well. It's kind of, and, uh, yeah. I have I have talked with so many people from the world that I came from that have had resounding positive experiences. So I'm in no way talking negatively about that. But okay. what I will say is I don't think, and I've never done it. Uh, I have no experience with it personally. Neither, neither have I. But from listening to them talk, especially from uh, people who are the most introspective and reflective, it's not the psychedelic 
that is really doing anything. It's the psychedelic that is creating the environment with which they can then do the work. Mm. If you think that this, it's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to go take uh, Ibogaine and Ayahuasca, the two that I hear the most, um, and I know they pair them with some other ones. I don't think it's actually the drug that does anything. It's laying the foundation where you can do the actual work. That's why you can do all the yoga you want to. You can be the most relaxed, fucking stressed out person on the face of the planet. Yeah. Because the yeah. yoga isn't solving your problem. No. You can actually, and, and just like anything else, you can take things too far. And I do know of people who, again, I have nothing negative to say about the psychedelic treatments. I'm glad to see that they're doing research into it. And I do hope that it gets to a point, if they find that it is as beneficial as it seems to be, that it can be brought into the U.S. instead of people having, it's like, fuck, come on, people. Yeah. And I also understand the complications of, you know, perhaps Big Pharma might have an interest in this. And maybe, you know, they prefer you take a pill and like, oh, God, and it's synthetic. Yeah, the whole. But I do know people who, I don't want to say habitually are using psychedelic treatments, but they're using it at a frequency where it's like, you know, are you are you using it at that frequency because you want it to do it for you? That's what they're hoping for. are you afraid for. to do it yourself? They're hoping for that. And yeah. I've had I had a uh, couple clients that did that, and I owned a CrossFit gym for yeah. a few years. You want to talk about people escaping into a, f a physical <laughs> realm where See? they're just crushing, crushing themselves, yep. and for that hour, they feel spectacular. But I'm here to tell people, as somebody who tried that, the real world is waiting for you when you're done with yep. your workout. When that euphoria <laughs> wears off, yep. the truth of what's still going on is going to kick you in the face, and so you can be a yoked, miserable person. Right, and I plenty of people that do that too constantly, yep. but that. Going to your point, you said something that's key, and this is the, the format of my work, is creating an environment and a framework, through a framework, that forces them to do the work, makes them deal with, not avoid or um, ignore, confront, confrontation. I, you, you said something once, um, you want to find out who someone really is, tell them no. Oh, yeah. And I thought, and I, I even told that to my uh, my business partner, and, and I told her, and she goes, that's, that's, a, that's confrontation. But and it works in it personal works. and professional Absolutely. Life. <laughs> and that's why I, I dug it. And I was like, absolutely. And confrontation is the only way. If you want to know a man's true strength, confront him. Yeah. Say no to him. Push him. And it goes back to the environments. They're not given the right, and these high performers are not given the right environments that can capitalize on their potential that's still untapped, that can maximize their power and get them to a place of experiencing internal peace rather than trying to seek it outside of themselves. I had a client who was a former Wall Street guy, Fortune 100 company executive, managed a $1.1 billion account. And he left the corporate world and he wanted to become a, um, a life coach, performance coach, whatever labeled there's so many coach everybody's a damn coach Weird choice but okay um he, he had something to give and um we met at a, an event in, in mexico and um he was all about the di ayahuascas and the uh, kimball frog poisons and the dmts and stuff but it, it created a disheveled version of himself because he was hoping that that were that those were going to be the hacks to high yeah. performance in this new world he did all right for himself in the beginning. But when we met, he said, look, I, you know, I know something different about you. I was watching at the event and we started talking. We spent four months together and we decided to work together. And I told him, I said, this is you're you're trying to find solutions and, and you're trying to hack your way to the best version of yourself. And you're overriding and not looking and facing truth about yourself. And he said, well, I don't I don't know what to do with that. He goes, I I don't even know my and the, the drugs are beneficial when they're using the right environment, when they have the right type of support, right containment. He literally said, I don't even know if my own memories are real because of how much he beat himself up just trying to figure out the hack to get through using this, this substance. I had another Hollywood uh, gal who was a, um, a celebrity out there and she did the same thing. She, I'm gonna do my own thing. I'm like, you know what? If you're gonna do your thing, go for it. I'm right here when, it, when you come back and you're completely yeah. fucked up. And she did. And we were at dinner one night in Beverly Hills and she said, look, I don't even know what dimension I just came from or what the f happened in my life right now. She goes, I can't trust myself because she wanted to just go figure out how to use all of these different, you know, psychedelics to better herself. And I'm like, you're not going to better yourself unless you're in the right environment and the right containment. The and hack culture is so dangerous it's crazy. in my mind. There, There is, you know, I, I get like hacks for reducing clutter in your inbox. I'll buy that one. <laughs> sure. I'll get hacks for using AI software that helps you arrange your calendar. Right. There's not a hack for experience. No. There's not a hack for putting in hard work. But everybody is looking for the shortcut It because it's faster. It's Are there more, hacks in the military with the teams? 
when it comes to operational security and functionality and the way you operate together? I mean, do you guys hack yourselves to No, we best target? practice our way there. <laughs> That's what I mean. Yeah, yeah. there's no hack. I mean, the best, the best ideation or even close approximation of a hack would be we have a robust AAR process, right. which is not short. So we're already out of the hack world. And a collaborative environment between now all the teams, East and West Coast, at least it was when I left, where we share data. All of that, again, takes a lot of time. So we can make sure that the people who are the most exposed to the real-life threats have the most up-to-date information. No. But it's not, a, it's not a hack. That's more like just a TTP, like right. a tactic, and, technique, and procedure. And I just asked yeah. that because, again, to prove the point, you, when you want to be the best and when you want to get to yeah, it, the no top of your game. there's no correspondence course for buds. Like, I'm going to take the one-week <laughs> hack course. Like, yeah. No, yeah. it's not no, how that works. It doesn't work that way. You have to, you have to live it to get right. the So consider benefit. human performance as a human being performing in your life personally and professionally because they are both together. They are interconnected. If you try to find the shortcut to this here in your life, you're going to do the same over here and eventually becomes the norm and you get accustomed to that. And then you live that life where I'm going to constantly try to find the shortcuts, the hacks, the ways in which I can ex ex expedite my way to the top. Yeah. And those are the kinds of people to get into the air quotes again, leadership positions that fuck culture up and cause dysfunction especially when they have this uncontained environment we call social media nowadays and everybody starts tweeting and Instagramming. And for me, it's like, Oh, so going back to the, the psychedelic aspect, the hacks, it's, it's, it's the environment that matters and in doing the work, the hard work that's, I'm in, in a conversation with a gal that I met who is a successful lawyer, uh, is getting noticed by some big publications. She's being, uh, for, for the work that she does. And she literally goes, I, it's like, I, have to tell her right now what matters is the ugly stuff you have to well can we just focus on my brand and my public figure pr presence um, no when if we decide to work together go hire a pr firm for that that's what i'm saying but don't do that yet because i'm telling you until you f unfuck what's really going on with you right yeah. now all of those efforts are going to be futile you're never going to get as maximized potential out of that and you're going to waste more money and time and the real work is the ugly stuff nobody wants to do and they go well let me find i don't like that it's it's too hard and i had a podcast host say that to me he goes why would anyone want to do that work with you it sounds too hard i said you have an audience full of seven and eight figure earners entrepreneurs and you're telling me they don't want to do work they yeah. don't want to do the stuff that is uncomfortable how the hell did they get to where they are and, and it's it's anyway it's and what if they had the realization and again it's not like it's not, of course, a guarantee if you do the hard work, your success no. is going to springboard. But you're stacking something that you can control in the odds in your favor if you do. But if people could come, so say you have seven or eight figure earners and they're sitting there like, wow, if I actually did this work, maybe I could go from a seven figure earner to an eight figure earner or an eight figure earner to a nine figure earner. If yeah. they're already at that spot, you're telling me they wouldn't be interested in that. I don't think you understand your audience if that's your <laughs> position. That's the thing. And, and that's what blew my mind. And going to what you just said, there's the gap right there where... Why can't I go from seven to eight? Well, maybe because there's personal shit you haven't looked at yet. But let me go find the strategy that this big big name celebrity coach is selling right now across Facebook ads and buy into this $15,000 program here or this $20,000 thing here because that'll give me the answers that I need to then scale my business to that eight figures. It is where I go for mental health resources. <laughs> is Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Or Instagram. I hate the same thing. My, I, 12 years, pandemic hit and people were like, hey, look. I don't know how to explain what you do. Can you put something together? And I thought, oh my, reluctantly, like, I don't want a, a website. How have you enjoyed that journey? <laughs> Sucks. <laughs> I, honestly, it's been one, I'm glad I'm here with you, talking to people like you about this stuff because yeah. it helps add into that one dimensional space because it's so hard to distill down who I am and what I do into this website of where nobody's buying anything from me through a website. It's conversations. It's meeting people. But I played the game and it was a labor of love. And I honestly don't really enjoy sitting down behind a computer and thinking about what philosophy can I tweet today or what Instagram post can I make today? I've obviously have pe I do have people that handle that stuff yep. and uh, we're trying to figure out a good campaign. I started my own podcast recently just to have more of a fun laid back environment uh, with, with cool guests sipping some good whiskey um, and just talking about all things high performance in a low key environment. So that's been fun. I like that. But um, and kudos to people that run podcasts because that's a completely different world figuring out building one of those things. But, um, you know, Michael and I have it. navigated our way through. Seems How like long it. we've been working together, Michael. I was just thinking about that. I think it's like three years now. For, uh, for, and for the, and you know, you want to talk about uh, a journey that was characterized by tripping and falling on your face. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, when I first, I <clears throat> when I first, I'm going to do a video about this soon because there's a couple things I really enjoyed about doing the jump expedition that I could never have fathomed that I would like. One thing I found that I really liked was making like the daily vlog thing as we were yeah. jumping. I was like, fuck, this is fun. Yeah. And it actually, I travel a bunch. I watched it. Yeah. I paid I travel, attention. And yeah. it's like, okay, I actually like doing this. So I'm going to, and so I created a separate YouTube channel and anything Nod Podcast. And actually, the reason I created the second YouTube channel is talking with guys from Black Rifle who are like, listen, if you put everything under one banner, and you do something at some point that might now might seem awesome, but in a year from now, whoever's in charge throwing the levers doesn't like that, you lose everything. That's so so maybe yeah. diversify. I'm like, oh, shit. That's smart. But I started you know, the podcast with a small little Zoom. And so to the video I'll make, the m number one question I get is, how do you start a podcast? And right. where should you start? It's like, listen, you know what? I've been at this like almost six years. I could probably at least help people by telling them where I started because it's a fucking comedy of errors. <laughs> I've lost audio it, files. Yeah. I've lost video files. I fucking forgot to hit the record button on two hour conversations. It's pretty awesome. If you can think of something dumb, I've definitely done, it. done. Just put my name on it. But yeah. I started with, <laughs> started with two microphones and a little Zoom. Yeah. And then four microphones and a Zoom. And, and arms that didn't even move around. It was, a, it was a stand that I literally had to put a rogue fitness weight on to hold it in place. <laughs> wow. All right. And I would lug right. it around in, right. this little con in this little box in the yeah. like, hotel rooms. And the audio was like, I thought, like, God, I forgot to turn the AC off again. Or like cars are blaring in the background. Like none of this shit works. And then, you know, the pandemic, it, it goes to this place of, okay, what can you control? What's going on in the world? Nope. But what can I do? Let's focus on the things I have control of. Found an office space for the first time. I used to do it out of my house, and I'm thinking, well, this might be uncomfortable for people I've never met, specifically women I invite to the podcast. They're not going to want to come to some dude's house 30 minutes out into the woods. Little rapey. You know what I mean? Right, right. That's right. not the vibe yeah, that that's I'm not going, the vibe you're for. going for. Yeah. One from the podcast. The environment you need. A little like, hey, maybe I want to wear your skin like a leotard. Not a big deal. <laughs> so professionalize a little bit. But yeah, then you're thinking, yeah. that can help you <clears throat> consistent audio experience. I'll invest into a better microphone system. And I, and I will be the first to admit I was very lucky knowing uh, Jamie, the guy who is producer for jokes. I'm like, hey, dude, yeah, what do I need? But it still slowly built over time. For years, I never had video. And then it was – I played with the little GoPros, and then it was Sony hand cams. And eventually, people can't see these cameras, but they're Blackmagic cameras. And they're, they're one of a variety of options you can get. There's pros and cons for them. And there's cost that comes with all of this stuff. And then – I was editing all the videos on my own and, and meshing it. And that's how Michael and I started working together. He would edit behind the scenes. And then six months ago, maybe we started doing live yeah, in the studio. It was, yeah, but it's like, awesome. okay, like, hey, we'll take it to the next level. Like, yeah. I wanna, I'm going to save us both time. Because I used to be, I would do a two and a half hour episode. Then I would have to turn right back around and listen to it again and do the camera angle switches. So it was great to offload. And that was a tough step for me to actually offload that level of control. I can imagine. But, you know, and Michael's very savvy with this stuff and he's very smart and it's like honestly it's like hey this button does this camera and that one does that one so yeah I I'll, could, I'll, I'll give him the kudos i watch your videos uh, yeah it, clearly it's it's flowing really well yeah but it saved us make me blush yeah <laughs> didn't save us it didn't save us time but now at the end of the episode like it'll be ready to upload right this will come out in a couple weeks uh because there's a few in the queue but quick ad read and then boom and then it's nice and then the, the last edition was the tv thing and you know we did a podcast yesterday and I'm not ashamed to admit we were talking shit about the Liver King because it's one of my favorite topics. And so we pulled up pictures of him and we're, you know, discussing. I think you had a show with that with Evan, though, right, uh, from Blackrock. You talked about that, too. It comes up all the goddamn time. Uh, I, I think right? you want to talk so about times. hypocrisy and liars. Just like, <laughs> I'm yeah. not lying. Like, you're clearly Dude, lying. Come on. Like, it's like, like, I'm not holding a coffee cup in my hand. Like, it's a fucking coffee I, cup in I, your I've hand. eaten liver and I I was a bodybuilder at one point and yeah. I still, there's no way I could even get, I mean, I. I had to take supplements to sure. To just grow. give me twelve thousand dollars a month, and I'll help you get there. There, there it is. Yeah, it's but it's slow over time, and hopefully it could be valuable. You know, but it's yeah. like the podcast journey. What I thought it was going to be when I started, I had absolutely no idea what it was actually going to be. I never thought that I would have a studio, and it would be enough of a value to people that they would take time out of their life to fly here to see me. Because when I first started, it was you know the proposition is, hey, I'm brand new at this. The platform is nowhere near the size that I would want it to be. Can I come to you? You know, so it was mm -hmm. a lot of traveling to other people. And then at some point, the value proposition will switch and then they will come to you as opposed to you having to make the travel. But that we're talking years. We're not yeah. talking days. No, of weeks. course. Yeah. But no hack. But, There's you no know, you've never 
You've never done the podcast thing. Nope. You've never been on social media. You've never done the website. You are facing the things that you are on have very less uncomfortable level. with. Yeah, but that's also you're taking your own advice. And that's the show's called Wise Words and Whiskey. It's low key conversations on high performance living. And I've had some really cool guests. I had actually had a seal on uh, my last recording. Who was it? Uh, William Brunham. Can't Brunham. say I know him. He was a sniper, uh, sniper instructor. I'm trying to remember what team he was with. But um, I had to I just have a, a collected group of different types of people from screenwriters to, you know, athletes to business owners. But and it is I've only recorded 14 episodes now and it is very uncomfortable to do it because you have to maintain and manage so many things going on in your head. Uh, keep the flow going. Keep the time going because I don't have a clock. So I just have this internal mechanism. That's actually a good move. Um, and just I'm in a studio in Phoenix, so I don't have my I don't have my own studio built out yet, and that's fine. I'm willing to make the investment in it. I drive down there the two hours to go record a couple episodes back to back. I send my guests bottles of whiskey as a gift to say, hey, thanks. This is the whiskey we're going to share on the show. Yeah. And then I have to go back and I we we do the show notes ourselves, but then we send it off to a, a, a team of people that do this for a living to produce it, get the YouTube videos ready yep. to go because we've done the YouTube page, et cetera. But it is very uncomfortable to start listening to yourself and go, no, and I, I think I, I kind of held that a little longer. I could maybe I, just improving yourself, but it's worth facing those discomforts or however the, the self like talk goes. To well, the other option it. is you don't face any of those things and you wake up a year from now or 10 years from now and you're in exactly the same, same spot. place. That's the whole, or the you could take uncomfortable steps. Like when I started this podcast, I had no idea where it would go and the people that it would introduce me to. I didn't really understand what podcasting was, and it is by far the most rewarding thing that I do now. I get to sit down with interesting people. I don't know where our conversation was going to go today. It's just like, hey, <laughs> neither, what's going but, on? Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and that comes through practice, though, too. When I first started, I thought, I'm like, okay, you got to fill every second. You have to know everything that you're going to talk about. And what, what I found was if you come into it preloaded, you listen less. And you're better off just listening and letting the conversation go where it wants to go. That's a, that's a very good point. I've watched so many episodes of different podcasts and shows. I've been on them myself, and I I'm, I kind of burned out of the prepackaged um, scripted questions. And I'm tired of people asking me about my childhood. And, and I'm just gonna be blunt. Um, tell us about your childhood. Well, why yeah. is that? How does that have any fucking value to your audience that they know about the fact that I you know Dude, this you could have grown this. up in a circus that'd be super valuable. Right. I'd be like, okay, tell me more. Did you like? Did the elephant touch you? Like touch and show I understand, the doll? Where did yeah, it touch you? Exactly. And I understand yeah. and respect. I understand. I'm not knocking these people because they want to give their audiences that they have some value of where were you at? How did you start? And what did you learn? And where did you, were you? And, but that linear approach to conversation. That's why I was looking forward to having having you know, this conversation because I pay attention to what you do. And I thought, you know what? He gives a format of just letting it be a relationship and connecting to people. And I found m more information is able to come out in a yeah. very authentic way that can land for people th through this type of format. And it's, um, it's a, I, I, I find it beneficial. So I appreciate it. It doesn't yeah. work for everybody. And no. at the end of the day, the beauty is the consumer, which yeah. gets to absorb information and listen or not. They pick and choose the, the format that they like the best. It's not for everybody, and I'll tell you right now, one of the lessons you'll learn, probably already have in 14 episodes, is you're never going to please everybody. No. Especially oh. when you put it on the internet. That's a good <laughs> 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 that is a very, very valid point. People always have something to say. Even when things they are will. going well for them, they will still say something. Perfect is not something. possible. No. And, it, you can't, and you're right. You can't please everybody, and who cares? And if you are committed to a goal, and even going into more of why I do the work I do is... If you're committed to something you say you want, who gives a shit at the end of the day, what people are going to say, how they're going to look at you. It's If you let that infiltrate your thinking and your mindset, you might as well hang up your spurs and stop riding bulls. I mean- Well, you're not being yourself. No. It's a tough one. You know, I there are a lot of people that I know of who will publicly say, well, I don't care what people think of me. Sure. And I've been caught in that, in that lie also, which is the actual description, I think, an accurate description of what it is. And I know- that I'm lying when I say that. And I try not to say it anymore because social media, for better or worse, it connects us to people you're never going to meet. And you'll get 100 comments on an Instagram post. If there's one negative one, That's true. it consumes 99% yeah. of your time. You'll disregard all the good ones to look at the negative one yeah. because it's... <clears throat> And again, I don't know. That's that prehistoric. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I don't know how the brain works, but for whatever mind, reason, the yeah. negative feedback, it traps your attention and you do think about it. You do care. I'm sure there are some people out there who really don't give a fuck, but there are also people out there who want to collect heads in jars in their fridge. Well, that's a good point. So well, there's that. For me, I just try to do a better job of managing it and recognizing, okay, the, the, there's a smaller percentage of negative comments than there are positive. 
am I paying percentage of my attention and time wise a commensurate amount, five percent on the five percent that are negative and 90, like, let's at least balance it out. Let's sure. not do ninety five percent on the negative and ignore everything else. So it's I I do care. Yeah. I'm a I am a sensitive person. At That's the end what of the day. I was about to say. When you see those things and you have a reaction, a visceral reaction to them, is because you're an empathetic person who actually gives a shit. But you got to manage it. That's the thing. There's no yeah. what's happening right now in the world. There's no management. People are just uncontained and unleashed on social media, and they are constantly just un- letting out all of their grievances, and they're they're speaking to each other with passive aggressive approaches. There's yeah. this argumentation, gaslighting each other. Everyone's fighting and bickering. It feels like we've gone backwards into high school, and it becomes social media strips humanity, humanity from humanity. Absolutely, it's unbelievable. But when you care, you're going to have a visceral reaction. I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I'm some like you know, the guy that doesn't care because I'm so perfect with what I do. I, when I hear people say, th- I, I battle people even when I'm not working out in public, they have their own reactions to me, just my presence when I, because I don't let people act and, and behave a certain way that's unacceptable when it comes to interacting with me. You if someone is at the store and they say some stupid comment to me, I'm not going to take that and walk away and be like, yeah, that's not worth the time. Sometimes it's not, but most of the time it's like, hold on a second. I'm going to reorient this dynamic right now because it's unacceptable that you think. I don't know if I have it on my forehead that says approach this guy and, and talk shit, but I understand at the same time that I there, write that on my shirt sometimes. Yeah, I'm sure you approach this guy and talk shit. <laughs> Nobody ever I, does. Fuckers. Well, I know. <laughs> And that's just part of what I understand about myself is that when I'm in around people, they start to feel things and they 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 just they dump it. And I, I was sitting at a Whole Foods once and a guy goes, hey, something about you makes me want to tell you that when I was a kid, I got molested. And I'm not even remotely kidding. He said that to me in front of my wife and on a Sunday afternoon in La Jolla, right there off the five freeway. And I just looked at him and said, man, I'm trying to enjoy my lunch. My wife, I, I appreciate you feeling vulnerable enough to share that with me, but... And I just looked and I said, not the right setting. This buddy. is not the right setting. But he yeah. just, I don't know why I said that to you. I just I needed to get it off my chest. And this is where our world, and I'm using that as an example, is people are out there in the world and they're not contained properly. So they're allowed to spill, the, again, I say demons because these demons are talking to the demons and yeah. nobody is actually getting anywhere. There's no problem solving happening. There's no solutions being provided. It's just bickering. I'm right. I'm right. If you don't believe in what I'm talking about, then you're somehow an enemy against us. And it's it's from the Constitution to the gender stuff all the way across the board for people in politics. Um, when I see people that have um, shared things to me in the past, uh, you know, some of the social media stuff, I'm, I, I feel it. And I go, oh, wow. Um, but then I go, you know what? The management comes in. Yeah. I understand where that's coming from. It's not necessarily about me. It's just the way they're feeling and they're needing, they're, they're sharing it, but they don't understand what they're saying because they can't articulate and discern the difference between their shit and actually if I'm being something that's bad to them. And that's the key difference here. And I tell the clients I work with, when you're feeling what you're feeling when I'm in your face and I'm making you do things, it's not me. I'm not a threat to you. It's the shit you're carrying that's rattling inside you. You have to discern the difference and you have to rewire that mind that wants to look and see the negatives. Hunter Post, yeah. one negative. Why do you see that one? It's because we're wired to see the threats. We're wired to pay attention to the this the discomfort that can harm us. So we instantly go to that. You've got to learn how to manage that inner volatility. The only way you can do that is be put in positions that literally shakes you, scares you, and rattles you from the core so you can build that resilience and that strength to be able to manage that. And then that then can accentuate who you are and how you perform. I've tried one step that has helped me a little bit on social media. And again, I'm not perfect at this. I can tell somebody to eat dicks occasionally online. (laughs) I'll try to remember that we all have our own shit and not everybody, you know, like I have my bad days and I have my good days. I am relatively good at managing my bad days and keeping it off of other people's radar. And I don't lash out because I can recognize that I'm having a bad day. Not everybody's in that boat and everybody's dealing with shit in their life. And social media is so easy to fire off a blind comment that I just try to be a little bit more empathetic. I'll ask myself, you know, what do you think could be happening in their life right now? You know, fuck, they could have just gotten fired. Maybe they're maybe they're in a super toxic relationship and this is their venting probably actually doesn't have anything to do with you. And it helps. And again, sometimes it's like eat dick. Other times I'm just like, you know what? It's going to be okay. But adding that additional step and forcing myself to try to at least be more empathetic and look at it through potentially their eyes. And I mean, honestly, I'm making up scenarios in my head. Yeah. Like, well, maybe this person's having this. I I don't know, but I'm going to give them the grace because they're probably a good person at the end of the day. Well, think about that. That's a good point. 
people don't know how to hold or carry energy anymore. And what I mean by energy, I'm just mean by when someone beeps at you or, or you beep at them and they instantly be back at you, even though they cut you off. I know you, I don't know if you've experienced that, but I've experienced that where I beep someone. Never and almost driving. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, sarcasm is your love language. It's fantastic. <laughs> but that is them in their inability to carry what they just felt. They get yeah. that shock and that startle. So when you're out in social media and people are running their mouths about topics that they're passionate about, which is fine. Absolutely have it. That's what makes America so great. Uh, they see that and it hits them inside and they can't carry that feeling that they're having and they just have to express it. And we've given people permission to just loosely express themselves. And tools. Right, and tools to just express yourself. Yeah. Do it anywhere, anytime, however you want to because that is, and if anybody tells you no, that's censorship. That's suppression and it's oppression. And it's like, hold on a second. Are you discerning the difference? Are you managing yourself? There are times to punch someone in the face and there are times not to. Um, I miss the days when you could do that physically because sometimes the best lessons are learned when you get physically thrown around. Uh, Certainly it was true with me when I was younger. I mean, it's the same thing with the, the concept of hazing in the military. I, I enjoyed it. I think it was a necessary part of, especially in combat arms, to really... It just it built up the culture more, and it really gave you appreciation for earning the things you earned. When they beat my rank into my collarbone, and they yeah. it, it, all of that was valuable, and it did not bother me whatsoever. But people nowadays are too free, if you will. I'm going to use that learn, uh, term lightly because people hear me say that, and they go, oh, "You're against freedom." It's like, no, I'm not against freedom. I'm just. I'm all about facing the fact that we are not contained properly and people are just allowed to spill whatever. And that's what happens with people that talk shit on the internet is they hear something, they see something and it rattles whatever they're carrying and they just let it out. There's no, it's almost like, Oh, there it goes. It's like firing around without even considering the target. Do you think they feel better after that? Yeah. They release that. That's a relief. They, they feel a temporary relief, but it doesn't change anything that they're going through. It doesn't resolve the pain they're in or, but it gives them a place where you carry it for me now. If like, you choose to, so I'm saying that's adding, what they want. But when adding they do those it. extra steps and, yeah. and thinking about yeah. somebody like instead of it just being a John five eight nineteen forty eight <laughs> whatever it is, and be like oh fuck you motherfucker because you told me to fuck off. It's like hey, he absorbed something or this he or she whoever it may be spit it my way, made them feel better. I don't actually have to pick this rock. No, up. no, moving right no, along. That's okay. Yeah, right off your back. I, yeah. My my father was. Um, very stoic by nature and he would tell us as kids and he taught us how to fight when we were young he said look never start a fight always finish one and one of the thing the things is um again we put boxing gloves on at family functions and we just beat the crap out of each other in the backyard while the it's adults get drunk that's how yeah, that's how love. men yeah. express love we beat the shit out, out of each, each other. other cousins fight each other yeah. my brother who became the ranger um uh, would tie one hand behind his back and beat up my cousins. I mean, it's just because it was just built that way. Just that might, fight. Be, a, that might be a touch much. Uh, but yeah. A little if, braggadocious. But. <laughs> <laughs> but he would. He put his tight hand behind his yeah. back and he would beat my cousin up. But um, my point I'm, I'm bringing that story up is one of the things he taught us was that um, when people see that they've gotten under your skin, they own you. Yeah. And he would beat that into our heads. Don't let people get you or at least see that something changed within you because that gives them the power and you no longer in the, in the driver's seat. But then he said, you have to learn the balance of figuring out what, uh, what deserves your attention and energy and what does not. And then taking that into into the lessons of life and leadership, et cetera, has just been profound and the ability to have a better life. So I want other people to learn that too, is can you slow down that thought process when you're feeling something and rather than letting it out, letting it rip, or if you need to, what's the environment you're in? Yeah. Yeah. Um, where can people find you? I got to hop back over to the uh, coffee shop and do a meeting here pretty shortly. I'm gonna be, we've been at it for almost two and a half hours. Holy mackerel. That's how you know you're having a great conversation. Ah, that's great. But people who, now that you are on social media and you know, social media for all the negatives, it is a great portal for people to sure. be able to connect with you. So sure. where can people find you? And where can they find more out about what you are doing? Oh, um, we'll have the wise words and whiskey podcast. Um, I don't know if you're interested in maybe coming on as well. I'd love to have you. Uh, That'd be great. Uh, If you're interested, sip a little whiskey. Have a great conversation. Wise Words and Whiskey. It's um, uh, YouTube and Apple Podcasts. They can listen to that uh, there as well. But uh, I have my website up if they want to learn more about my philosophies and the work that I do, wileymcgraw.com. I am on Twitter and Instagram, but we have people building that out right now to kind of get the feel of how do I want to utilize that? Um, I'm doing some like media tours right now and get on some TV stations and interviews. Yeah. And uh, I think I just got invited on a Charlie Kirk show. Uh, so I'm working with PR 
to get into there. Just to, I'm going across the board, no matter what your views are, yeah. just to have great conversations. Um, there's a uh, Lewis Howell. I'm getting ready to go on his school of greatness, things like that. So there's different ways in which people can just pay attention to what I'm talking about when it comes to our leaders, our politicians, our public figures to, to truly get unfucked and really live the life that they say that they're living in public and marrying those two versions so that people have permission to do the same for themselves. Because going back to our military service, if you are the inspiration for these younger generations to step up and face discomfort and, and, and go towards the things that are scary, they're going to become better people and better leaders ultimately when they start taking over companies and, and industries and making decisions and policies for this nation. So I think that's a, an important part. But that's th those are the places people can come hang out. Last question for you. Yeah, of course. Uh, it might be a little bit broad, but it seems like what you do specifically at, a, at an interpersonal level is it's very bespoke, right? It's not for the masses. Right. But mm -hmm. – for people who are listening to us and they and they like what we are talking about or they like what you are saying, but they're never going to have the ability to necessarily have a direct touch point with you. Where would you start people? What would what direction? How would you orient their compass for them and maybe give them a mm. uh, I don't want to say true north, but just a, a rough direction to start making progress towards? I'm going to land that answer with the same philosophy I think we started this conversation with is you have to do something scary and uncomfortable, no matter what it looks like. Ballroom dancing in front of other people, jumping out of an airplane, um, joining the military, finding the environments that challenge your comforts is the only way, even if it's small, is going to start to evolve and change you. So I, that's where I would want people to even go is if you're avoiding a specific uncomfortable conversation with a loved one, have that fucking conversation. Confront your dad, confront your mom. Just tell them how you feel in that environment that's contained through a set up dialogue. Um, I find people that want to achieve this higher level of personal growth and success are afraid to do the fundamental hard stuff to actually get them on that path. So they are caught up in that rat race in that uh, incessant pool of hacks and, and bypass and, and, and tools and strategies that can uh, short cut them to where they want to go rather than facing the hard path that it takes to get there because it's not necessarily just hard work. It's just about doing the things that are uncomfortable. And sometimes the more you do it, the more comfortable you get at it and, and the easier your performance and your success, success, excuse me, becomes. So that's what I would say to people is just do something that scares you no matter what it is or how big or small it is. That's where we'd start. Easier said than done, but it is. super impactful. It is. I mean, the moment I feel uncomfortable inside about a situation I'm about to have, I, I'm, I know that's, I have to have, I have to do it. Yeah. You're in the right spot. I'm in the right. It, and when you feel that viscerally that you are in the right spot, discern whether or not it's an actual threat to your physical well being, and then step towards it anyway, because even if you botch it, at least moving the energy by having that conversation or that confrontation is going to do things for you that you can't see right now, but it will, it will show up for you in ways you least expect. Awesome. Yeah. Great ending, man. Thank you for the thank time. Thank you, brother. I, really I appreciate, appreciate it. Yeah, thank awesome. you for having me.